Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Now, before you freak out, well, I guess you can, you're, you're, you can freak out. You're probably going to freak out. I have no mustache. I have, I have removed the last piece of facial hair on my face. And uh, I know it's weird. It's weird, but we'll get over it. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get past this. You'll get used to it. Um, and in a month or two, my mustache will be back. But yeah, <laughs> welcome in, everyone. Um, <sighs> Happy Tuesday. We're live on a Tuesday. This is the first Tuesday we've been live in a year and a half. Year and a half. <laughs> I, know, I know it's a lot of change all at once. Um, uh, yeah, there's a comedian that has a joke about how when you're a kid and your dad just shaves his beard all of a sudden for no reason. It's kind of what happened here. <laughs> it's true. So I uh, I put this shirt on after I started stream, so I didn't know how bright it would be. I mean, it makes my skin look brighter, too. But uh, welcome in, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, and my shirt uh, matches the uh, the Code Red emote. And if you want a shirt like this, you can check out our merch. But thank you all for that hype train. Four subs, 350 bits. Really appreciate it. Um, Pyramid with the uh, four-month resub, thank you. Limitless with the four months. Uh, Physique with the 14 months. Dana True with the 150 bits, thank you for that. Physique with the 200 bits. And Andrew Lane with the 18 months. I feel like it's been a while, Andrew. Glad you could be here. Yes, <laughs> I am CJ. You have you're at the right channel. Uh, I pre I appreciate that, Mark Boots. He says I look good. You guys just are not that good at being funny. <laughs> Do I look like Joe Pesci? Here's the thing. I have I have gained weight during the pandemic, so like you can you can see my face is is chubbier, um, and it's easier to see when I don't have facial hair to hide it. Um, so this is also motivation for me to eat better and exercise because I need to I need to slim down a little, a little bit. Oh. But welcome in. I appreciate you all for being here. Um, if you are on the Discord, you likely saw that we have a schedule now. Um, so if you go to uh, twitch.tv slash coding garden slash schedule, um, you will look. Oh man, <laughs> that's that's me. I have, I have no facial hair. Okay, but uh, you'll see that we have some some streams scheduled. Um, and actually, let's see if uh, if this link still works. I actually don't know if it does. Let's see. It doesn't. I need to fix that. <laughs> I'll actually fix that right now. What was the command that we, we ran? Exclamation mark schedule. Let me fix it. <clears throat> Do, 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 do. Oh, that's a Samwise. Samwise command. I think I need to fix that in the Samwise bot. That's a whole different thing. Um, well, yeah, so th that actually does work. If you go to cdg.sh slash schedule, that link does work. That goes here. Um, and thank you, Asaf. I appreciate that. So you can go there. Uh, let, let me let me fix the bot really quick because, um, cause, yeah. Though, actually, I think if I modify the bot, I don't think it'll restart. Maybe it will. Uh, Samwise Gardner Twitch bot. Let's see. It's been a really long time since I've touched this code. Um, import text commands from text commands. Stream schedule. Let's see if that auto restarted. Why does my bot look like Peter Griffin? My my, I don't know. Does he? <clears throat> um, let's take a quick stretch. <laughs> we're 
we're, uh, we're, we're getting into it. Um, let me just see if the bot restarted. Mm, I think the bot restarted. Yeah, there we go. Wonderful. Wonderful. So click that link. You can see the schedule on Twitch. I'll, I'll update the command later, but um, I also I have a Google Calendar with the streams. So you can uh, go to this calendar, click on a stream that you would like to tune in for and add it to your calendar. Or if you're a big enough Coding Garden fan, you can just straight up add the uh, ICS file to your calendar, and then you'll know when every single Coding Garden stream will be, because I'm going to keep this updated. Now, I say that I actually need to update it because I have a stream scheduled for Sunday uh, from 6 to 9, but I'm not going to be able to make that one. I might move it a little bit later, but it'll it'll be updated at least a day or two before. I'll go with the sub. Thank you very much. 27 months. <laughs> I must ask you what happened. <laughs> um, well, actually, I mean, there there is a reason. I uh, um, I mean, not 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 even. So there was a reason. I went to a Denver Fan Expo, formerly known as Denver Pop Culture Con, formerly known as Denver Comic Con. And part of the, my cosplays, I did not want to have a beard. However, there were so many people there that I wore a mask anyways, so you couldn't even see my face. <laughs> um, but regardless, uh, this is the first time I haven't had a mustache in um, like six or seven years. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Thanks, Mark Boots. Will that auto-sync it? When something happens, wait, are you saying when somebody follows, I can send them a link to my calendar? I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> that's a that's a little too a little too much, but I like it. Huh? Huh? Okay. I have a typo in some of the streams in the calendar. Live stream. <laughs> okay, I'll fix it. You you know what I meant for the live stream on Friday. Whew, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a two step, so you could do five hundred for free. I mean, I feel like I could write that integration myself. I, I guess it just when they follow, it just sends them a Twitch message. And Twitch has calendar. Wow. Well, somebody add that to the ideas over here on Vox, because um, we can look into that lady. Uh, not lady. Later. We'll look into that later. <laughs> um, I'm not looking green. What do you mean? What do you mean? Okay. Um, cool. That's the calendar. Uh, if you want these links, join the Discord. There's an announcements channel <laughs> that has these links. Um, but if you would like to support the Coding Garden, please, please, please tune in uh, when I go live. So um, I don't know if this is going to be the schedule uh, going forward, uh, but it is going to be the schedule for this week. And uh, I mean, if you have been tuning in, you know that I've only been live on Fridays. So I'm trying different times of the day on different days of the week to see more people, really, because um, I, when I used to stream three times a week, um, I would see a lot of other names in the chat because certain people can't tune in on Fridays or certain people live on the other side of the world so they can only tune into later streams and such. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, and uh, Gary Goodspeed, thank you for the two months. And Alka, again, thank you for the 27 months. Cool. So that's the schedule. Uh, please tune in. All right, uh, we're going to start today off with the JavaScript array method of the day. So I could use some ideas. If you tuned in last stream, um, we did these array methods. So these are all search array methods, index of, last index of, includes, find, and find index. Um, so I want to talk about some array methods that are just a little bit more advanced than these search methods. Not maybe, Not advanced, but we should find a, a, a common uh, theme. So yeah, something like map and for each would be good. Um, or really, we, we could do like for each map and I don't know. 
<laughs> so how bad how bad is the audio off? I have a feeling my camera drifts because I tested it before the stream started and there was no delay. Um, I don't want to get into reduce today. We're gonna keep it fairly fairly uh, simple. Um, there's a second delay. No way. Okay. Count. I, I, you're you're gonna see the. Or you're gonna hear the clap first. How long after you hear the clap do you see see the clap? <clears throat> An entire second, less than half a second. We're gonna go with half a second. I feel like some of you uh, move through time a little bit faster. <laughs> um, we're gonna go with half a second. Seashell, seashells by the seashore. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Exactly 483 milliseconds. <laughs> uh, better? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll, I'll stick with that. Um, let me know if it happens again. I may just stop using this camera. Though it's a cool camera. I'm going to show you something that I didn't actually want to show you but I'm gonna show it to you anyways. First of all, this is my face, close up. And second of all, is there anything weird? This is actually what's happening. I know there's a bunch of junk over here, but uh, it's a 4K camera, and then I'm actually cropping out the section that I'm in, whereas normally only only the blue section is, is what you, uh, Normally the camera only looks at the blue section, but because this is a 4K camera, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't think I was gonna show you that, but I did. Okay, let's, be, let's get back on array methods. Um, I do I do like every and some. I feel like they're a little bit more advanced though than like the search methods that we talked about last time. Um, it, it's uh, Mokose. Oh, oh, I'm on a VPN, that's why. I was like, what? Mokose <laughs> uh, 4K uh, camera. And the cool thing about it is it is USB. So uh, if, you're, if you're getting into streaming and you don't want to have to buy a like HDMI converter, this thing is great because it's literally just a USB camera. Um, so yeah. And I feel like I could get it to look better. I just I'm not very good with camera settings. I need I need to spend an hour and just figure out how to make this thing look really good. Um, yeah. Oh, is it is this thing more expensive where you are, Ryan? And oh, in in Canada. Yeah. Uh, and Pib, thank you for the nine months. And Tyler, thank you for the six months. Who says reduce? I feel like we'll do reduce next time. Or maybe two times from now. I'm trying to have a gradual progression of complexity. Um, okay. We're gonna we're gonna talk about for each. We definitely are because last time we talked about uh, filter, and for each is even easier. Or like you should you should definitely learn for each before you learn learn about filter and, and a few of the other ones. Um, array from is not as interesting because you need something to get an array from. Though we've used array from a lot in like code golf because array from has like, it's basically like a built-in map while creating the array. I like that, David, because we could talk about like how to put things into an array, honestly. Let's do that. Let's talk about getting things into and out of an array. Now I know for a lot of you, you're like, oh, boring. But think about think about the kids <laughs> or, the, or the youngins. Think about all the beginners out there that get compu confused by how to how to mess with arrays. Um, so there's unshift. There's shift. Um, what else? Slice, 
Yeah, I like it. And splice. I don't know why I put the parentheses on all these. Take that. Yeah. Okay, this this is our theme. Our theme is uh, getting things into and out of arrays. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any other methods for getting things into and out of an array? I guess we could just do at because it's a new one. So we can say yeah, this doesn't put it into the array or get it out, but it accesses it. Is there an index? Yeah. Append? I don't think append is one. Oh, you could do concat. Concat does return a new array, though. This is a lot. <laughs> Fill? Oh, uh, yeah. Changes all methods, all elements in the array. I like it. OK. Um, there's not a join, is there? Oh, there is. What does join do? Creates a new array. Creates and returns a new string by concatenating all the elements in an array. I see. Yeah. I mean, I use that all the time, but I just I forgot what it does. Um, I don't think that fits with the theme. I, I kind of miss it too, uh, Swagopotamus. <laughs> um, but it'll grow back. Okay. I think, we, I think we've got a good list here. I might take three or a few of them out. Um, let's get it ready. Uh, JS uh, array method of the day. Mm. That's true, uh, uh, Mikas. I could, I could do a YouTube short on each of these. That's like a separate YouTube short for each of them. A AOTD is the algorithm of the day. Where did I put it last time? JavaScript of, of the day, I think is what I did. Yeah. Yes. That's the one. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, last time we talked all about searching. This is going to be about uh, modifying. We've got all these. Um... Okay, let's think about the order. Push is likely the first one you're ever going to learn. Um, you probably wouldn't even use pop for a while. Push is really mostly what you need. Um, we could talk about fill, because that's pretty simple. It just overwrites everything. Um, and I guess I, I want to talk about at last. Anonymous with the 10. Thank you so much. You're too kind. You're way too kind. Thank you for that. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I definitely want to talk about the... I'll probably talk about these first. I mean, really, push and pop are normally talked about in combination with each other, so we'll do that. And then we'll talk about these. The thing is, concat returns a new array, so I'm not going to talk about concat. Um, slice technically makes a copy of the array. It doesn't modify the array. However, it's good to talk about because we need to differentiate between the two. Um, and that. Uh, I, David, the answer is yes. However, there is a lot of code that hasn't made it to GitHub yet. And I need to review it before I push it up to make sure there's nothing uh, secret in there. Um, But after I do that, then yeah, I would absolutely take uh, pull requests. Um, 
There's also the backend code, though. So uh, the um, I think that that one is the latest. If you look at the API repo, but I don't know which one would need to be updated. Okay. Great. This is what we're going to talk about. Before we do that, I want to say hi to everybody because I forgot to. Uh, so bear with me. It'll take no longer than five minutes. We're going to welcome everybody in. And then um, we'll talk about array methods. Hello, Alka. <laughs> awesome. So if you would like to say hello to me, you can say any one of these things. Uh, hi, hello, hello, hey, yo, cheers, greetings, hi, us up, what's up, morning, afternoon, evening, howdy, good day, coding, hi, oh, 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 or boga, hey. If you say any one of these, I'll see your message, and I will acknowledge you. And we're going to go in the order of who was here first, and today it was SQL Gordster was the first person. I don't know if they were here first. They were the first person to say hello 32 minutes ago. Hello, SQL Gordster. Welcome in. What's up, Limitless? Good day, Mark. And hello, uh, Ludo. And uh, Denzel the Goat. And Mikus. And Kaseon. And Crimpy Squ Scrimpy Square. And Lou. Dynamic Voyage. Hello. Uh, what's up, uh, Alana? And I am uh, Saheb Giri. Hello. What's up, Dana Chu? And Mark Boots. Uh, Limeotes, hello, what's up, Crafty Becky, and Melinda Be Linda Beans, and uh, Goofer, and Gary Good uh, Goods Goodspeed, and Lucas, and Julian, and Leap Geek, and uh, Eridolov, hello, hello. It's me, I swear it's me, I am CJ. <laughs> uh, what's up, Issa Hassan, and Dehu, and Danger Mouse, and Veritatas, and Tyler, and Delta Time, hello, hello, uh, and thank you for the good lucks. Uh, what's up, uh, Lucky Fam? Newbie, welcome in. What's up, Pib Pib and White Legend and HTTP 404? Hello. Uh, what's up, Mike McBride? Uh, who says they just discovered the coding garden. Well, welcome in. Thanks for being here. Uh, do I work with React? I saw you work with Vue. Yeah, I, I work with both. Um, I like Vue more, but I do do a lot of React. I feel like streams later in the week, we'll do, we'll do some React content. I want to do... I'm always thinking of like what YouTube content I can create, like what stuff I can do on stream that I can clip into a YouTube video and React stuff is really popular. So I'll, I'll probably do some of that soon. And what's up, uh, Walk Up Neo and Timon? Do I stu still do the hello thing? I do, I'm just a little bit delayed today. Uh, what's up, Ryan and Murdoch, hello, who said, I normally have today off, but with the holiday and other stuff, I'll be tuned in part of Wednesday and definitely, thank you, Murdoch. I appreciate you for, for dropping by. Uh, best of luck with work and everything. What's up, Fun Planet and Alka and the Ox D and Nikki Poo and Auto Magic and Jewel uh, Futatabi and uh, Steve Monokuma and Cobb and uh, Cave and Pierman and what's up, Tessitura and Golden and Stutt and Nineleaf and Sid Who and Andrea Springer and uh, Theo Gomach, Theo Gomachadox and Asaf Amazon. Asaf Amazon. Hello, cheers. <laughs> Uh, what's up, Ringoon? Uh, I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad you found this channel. What's up, Pablo and Damir and Inadequate Dev and Poilino? Hello, Andrew and Robert and Nate and uh, Abdi Hakim and Wucha, uh, who says uh, Pixie.js or JavaScript Canvas for a mini game. Uh, that would be fun. I mean, maybe. Uh, it would be fun to watch me do that kind of thing. So, mini game? We could think of a mini game. Maybe we do like a 10 minute mini game challenge. That would be, a, that would be some YouTube content. Cool. Uh, what's up, Folk Bits, Folky Bits, and Scuba Steve? What's up? Uh, and Q Sync and Air Couldn't. Um, and hello, Mr. T McGush and David Snyder. Welcome in, everyone. I appreciate you being here. Uh, welcome to the Coding Garden. And also, I guess for any of the uh, the first timers, if I didn't get to say hello to you, welcome in. Thank you for for joining us here on the Coding Garden. Uh, Denzel the Goat and Pongo and Charlie and Andre Springer uh, and Diego and Asaf Amazon and Swiggity Swoot <laughs> Swooter and Luke Lucky Fam, Mike McBride, uh, Seek Insanity, uh, Wake Up Neo, Asim, uh, Swagapotamus, hello. What's up, Lox and Cobb and Nineleaf and Theo Gachmadox and Rangoon and Abdi Hakim and Mr. T. McGush and Fleet Admiral, thank you for saying hello, and thank you for being here in the Coding Garden. All right, we did it. It was only five minutes. I apologize if that was uninteresting <laughs> to some of you. <laughs> well, let's get into it. Now we're going we're gonna to write some code. We're going to talk about some code. And before I do that, 
Thanks for all the supports. Uh, Tessitura, thanks for that Prime sub. Anonymous with the 10 gifted. Uh, J.M. Bonner with the Prime and Raver with the Prime as well. Thank you all for the supports. Um, uh, it's a good question, White Legend. Uh, the drop game is broken. So it's, it's on the list of things to fix. So hopefully, I, I, I'm going to say I'm definitely going to do this later in the stream because I know a lot of you are here for the drop game and it's been broken for like the past four streams. So we're going to fix that today, but later. And Pib! Pib with the tin! Oh, you're too kind. Uh, thank you thank you for the tin, Pib. Pib, Pib, and Pablo with the bits. Uh, I'm already preparing for the Teach Me Channel Point reward you mentioned last time. Don't disappoint me. Well, it was a suggestion from someone else, but I like the idea. But the suggestion, I think, came from Ryan, uh, and it was, um, I'll do a stream where you can call, I'll have people call in, and you have five minutes to teach me something, or something like We'll, we'll figure out the format. Um, <laughs> what's up, Pranish Codes? I have, I have, I shaved. I shaved. Uh, and Eddie says, thank you, I can't wait to drop. Yeah. And what's up, Zamo? Uh, we're, we're, we use JavaScript, and um, we're about to talk about JavaScript and write some code, and I'm going to be using Node.js for this, and then also uh, Quokka.js, uh, which is running on top of Node.js, but you're going to see it, and you're going to be like, whoa, that is so cool. How does he do it? It's with Quokka. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great tool. You should, if, you, uh, if you like it, you should definitely, definitely get it. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to do a focus mode, and then we're just going to talk about these array methods. Um, I'll be sure to bring up MDN for all of these. Um, quack. Oh, I didn't know that was a command. <laughs> Uh, what am I doing? Focus start. This shouldn't take me 30 minutes, but we'll, but we'll see. Okay. Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden. I'm CJ. Today, we're going to talk about uh, how to modify arrays in JavaScript. So we're going to talk about some of the built-in methods um, in JavaScript for arrays. And uh, it's going to be a good time. But all of these methods, the things that they have in common is that they modify existing arrays. Now, the most basic method for modifying an existing array is push. Um, and it's likely the first one you're going to use. But let's see an example of it. So let's say I have an array of numbers. And it looks like this. And then let's say I want to put a new value into that array. I can use push. So if I say numbers.push and 4, that is going to modify the numbers array and put the value 4 on the end of it. What do I mean by modify? Well, if we log numbers, now numbers will have the value 4 on the end of it. So I'm going to start up uh, Quaka, which runs my code inside of the editor. And we can see that now when we log numbers, it has the value 4 inside of it. Um, and so that's what I mean by modify. It's not creating a new one. It's changing the existing one. Um, and we can push as many times as we want. And we can push whatever we want. It doesn't have to be in order. Um, like this and like this. Uh, but each time you push, that's going to put a new value into the end, uh, onto the end of the array. So easy stuff. Um, that's push. You'll probably use it all the time. It's a good one. Uh, the next one is pop. And so this actually removes the last value in the array. Um, and returns it. Um, so let's talk about that. So if I say uh, numbers.pop, what am I going to get back based on the previous code? If it removes the last value, I should get back 7 because 7 was the last one that I pushed in. So uh, let's see. So let's say, um, let's call this popped value. And uh, this is what I mean by... Um, by saying that this returns the last, uh, removes and returns. So um, popped value will have the last value in the array inside of it. So if I log popped value, we get seven because that was the um, uh, last number that I pushed into the array. But uh, again, this modifies the array. So if I look at numbers now, numbers no longer has the value 7 on the end of it. You can see that we have actually modify it, modified it by removing the last value. Um, and just like push, you can do pop multiple times. Um, let's actually change this to a let variable so that I can uh, reassign it. So if I do uh, this again, I should get the value 42. So I popped 42 off the array. And then if I log numbers, it doesn't have 42 in it. 
Um, and I can do that all day long. So these two are pretty useful. Push puts it onto the end of the array. Pop removes it from the end of the array. Awesome. Um, I am now going to talk about shift and unshift because these methods, instead of working on the end of the array, work on the beginning of the array. Um, and I always forget which one does which, so I'm going to go over to MDN to read about uh, which is which. Um, so one of them puts something onto the beginning of the array, and the other one removes something from the beginning of the array. Let, let's make a guess. I'm going to say that shift puts it to the beginning of the array, and unshift removes it from the... No, 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 opposite. Unshift removes it from the beginning of the array, and shift puts it onto the beginning of the array. Um, that's, that's my guess, but I don't have to guess. I can just look it up. Okay, the shift method removes the first element from an array and returns that removed element. I think I was right. I don't, I don't even remember what I said, honestly. But shift removes from the beginning of the array. Okay, so let's try and use it. Now we can see right now the numbers array has one, two, three, and four inside of it. So if I um, run shift on this, I'm go I should get back the number one, so it removes it from the array. Yeah, and so and that's the difference between pop and shift. Pop removes from the end, shift removes from the beginning. So um, if we say shifted value equals numbers dot shift, this should give me one because right now one is at the beginning of the array. So if I log um, that shifted value, we get one. So shift removes from the beginning. Um, and again, it, it modifies the array. So if we look at numbers now, numbers no longer has that one at the beginning of the array. Um, awesome. So let's, uh, let's do it again. And we should get back the number two, right? So that new shifted value is two. And if we look at numbers again, it doesn't have the value two in inside of it. We only have three and four. Awesome. Uh, now, unshift. Uh, does the opposite. It puts values at the beginning of the array. So if I say uh, numbers.unshift and I throw 42 in there, now our array should have the value 42 at the beginning. So if we log it, we should see 42, 3, and then 4. Awesome. And just like uh, push, you can do this as many times as you want. So we'll unshift, let's say, like 7, and then we'll unshift 1. And then now if we look at numbers, um, we see 1, 7, and 42, because first we put 42 in, then we put 7 at the beginning, and then we put 1 at the beginning. Um, so let's unshift. Um, I don't think I'll even remember it after doing this, but uh, you can always look it up. So shift uh, removes values from the beginning, and unshift adds values to the beginning. Yeah. OK, let's keep moving. So. Um, at this point, let's actually talk about uh, splice because it's somewhat related to like shift on shift and uh, pop and push because splice will either let you uh, insert values anywhere in the array, you given a specific index, or remove values from an array given a specific index. So, 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 and also like I always, uh, I always confuse splice and slice, but the way I remember it is like to splice something is to put something. I mean, I guess that's not a way to remember it. That's kind of just the definition of splice, but that's how I think about it. Splice is to put a thing in, and slice is really just used for making a copy. And let's actually make sure I'm right, because I could be wrong. So let's let's go over to MDN and look up array splice. But I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure array splice. Uh, removes things from the array. Uh, changes So splice changes the contents of an array by removing or replacing existing elements. Okay, so I, I got that right. So um, let's try it. Now, let's say I wanted to remove the number 7 from the numbers array. So right now the numbers array has 1, 7, 42, 3, and 4. I specifically want to remove the number 7. Now, I couldn't use uh, shift because shift removes the very first one, and this is the second one. So that's why I would use something like splice. Um, so if I say numbers.splice, um, I can specify the indice of the thing I want to remove. So this is indice 1, 
and then you specify how many things you want to remove from that indice. In this case, I want to remove one. So this says remove the element at indice one, which is seven, um, and remove one element. Uh, let's take a quick stretch. <gasps> when you slice a cake, you make a copy of the whole cake, huh? <laughs> I guess that's not true, is it? Um, but you technically can, because slice pulls out a section of the array, but it can pull out the entire array and make a copy. But we'll, we'll talk about slice in, in just a second. Okay, uh, so uh, this removes the seven because it's at index one, and we say remove one element. So if I log numbers now, now the number seven has been removed. Wonderful. Um, a cool thing, though, is you can remove more than one element. So let's say I want to remove both the 7 and the 42. If I pass in 2 here, that says remove two elements starting at index 1. So both the 7 and the 42 were removed from the array. Uh, we're going to just stick it back to 1. Um, and what's nice about this is uh, you can specify any, any, uh, any index. So um, Next, let's try removing that 3. And so that is at indice 0, 1, 2. So if I say numbers.splice uh, at index 2 and one of them, that will remove the 3 from the array. Wonderful. Um, now, the interesting thing about splice is you also can actually insert things at any location in the array. So it's not just for removing, though I will say the majority of the time when I use splice, I want to remove specific elements at a given index. But you can also use splice to put things at a specific index. So let's say I wanted to put the number 7 in between uh, 1 and 42. I can say numbers.splice. Um, I specifically want this to go at the first index. So I'm going to say index 1. Um, then how many things do I want to remove? None. Um, because I don't want to remove something. I want to insert something. And then what did I say? I'm going to insert the number 7. Um, there. I think that's how this works. Let's see. Yes. So, as you can see, I have inserted the number 7 at index 1, uh, and I have removed nothing. So, splice also lets you put things in without removing. Um, and I, I think you can insert multiple, or can you just do one? Um, oh yeah, you can just keep, look at this. You can just keep on specifying them. So that's another interesting thing. So let's let's try this. Let's say at indice two. So after um, actually, let's do indice three. So after the forty-two, I want to insert three values. Let's do that here. So I'm going to say uh, numbers dot splice will go at index four. So zero, one, two. No, we'll go index three. 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's going to be after the 42. Remove zero, zero items. Uh, so 0. And then let's insert um, a 7 and a 5 and a 6 and a 9. So uh, basically, all of these arguments, you can specify as many as you want. All of those are going to be inserted at the third index. So now, if we log numbers, we should see 1742, and then all of those numbers I wanted to insert, 7569, and then 4. <laughs> um, great. That's splice, and that's fun. And I bet you probably learned something just now with being able to insert things with splice. OK. Um, that's pretty much it for modifying arrays. I guess fill technically modifies the array. We'll talk about fill in a second. But now let's talk about slice, because splice and slice are almost the same word, except for one character, but they do different things. Um, and slice does not modify the array. So I, I've said this multiple times when we're talking about all of these, all of these other methods. Um, we are modifying the array. If you'll notice, I only defined the numbers variable, numbers array once, and then all of our code below has been modifying that array. We've been changing the contents of that array. Slice does not change the contents of the array. It creates a new array um, from a given section of the, the input array. So uh, let's look uh, slice up over here on uh, MDN. Um, so slice method returns a shallow copy. I'm not going to get into the details of deep copy or shallow copy, but uh, just know it, it, it only goes one level deep. But in this case, we're not dealing with reference types, so it doesn't really even matter. But let's do it. So let's say, so 
If we look, numbers array has all these numbers inside of it. Let's say I want a new array that only has the values uh, 42 and 7 inside of it. So I basically want to slice that little section out of the array. Let's do it. So if we say numbers dot uh, slice, uh, we can specify where do we want to start. So we want to start at 0, 1, 2. We want to start at the second indice. And then um, what indice do we want to end at? And I think it's non-inclusive. Let's see. Um, end the index of the first element to exclude from the returned array. So it's not inclusive. So if I say uh, indice 3, that actually will only give us back an array with the value 42 inside of it. Uh, and let's see that. So let's say uh, just 42 array. And if we log it, uh, we get an array that only has the value 42 inside of it. So this second uh, argument is non-inclusive. If we wanted to include uh, the uh, the 7 in there, we actually have to specify the index after the element we want to end at. So if we say just 42 and 7 array, we specify indice 4, and that will give us 42 and 7 in, in the resulting array. So you specify which index do you want to start at, and you specify um, which index do you want to end at, not including that index. OK, um, now, th that's the main thing. And you, you can pass in any index here. Um, also, I think you can do negative indices. Let's see what happens if we say uh, numbers.slice, and I do negative 1. Yeah, so you can do negative indices, and it'll actually pull from the back of the array. So this creates a copy with just the last element in the array. And if I do like neg minus 5, that'll just give us the last five values um, in the array. Um, so that's fun. Um, and then also, a, a way that I typically use this is just to create a full copy of the array. So you technically could do, so right now if we look at uh, our numbers array, um, it's still, it hasn't been modified, right? So this is what our numbers array looked like before we started slicing it. Slice does not modify it. It's just creating a new array with uh, a copy. It's creating a, a copy with only the values that we specified. So numbers still has all the stuff in it. Um, but if I do slice with no arguments, you'll see that we just get back the array itself, but it's actually copied it. So it's created a new array and then copied each of those values into it. Um, and we can see that like this. So if I say uh, new numbers equals numbers dot slice, um, it looks the same. But if we compare new numbers and numbers, they are different arrays. They're a different reference, um, so they're not the same. I'm not. I'm not going to get into the details of that. But basically, it's a new array with copies of everything, even though it looks exactly the same. Um, a copy. <laughs> uh, great. So th this is typically, so if you're ever working like with functional programming or you're working in React, a lot of times you want to create a copy of something uh, or a copy of an array and then modify the copy. Using slice uh, with no arguments is typically one way that you can do that. All right. Identical twin, not the same person. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, so that's slice. That's splice. Um, great. Let's talk about fill. And then lastly, we'll talk about at. So if I say, uh, and actually, we'll, we'll work on new numbers. So right now, if we again, if we look at new numbers, it's just a copy of the one that we were working on before. It has all of the values. But if I say uh, new numbers dot fill, and then I pass in the value 0, I believe this actually modifies the array. I could look it up. I keep saying believe. I could look it up. I could look it up and know exactly what it does. But I, I'm pretty sure that this modifies the array and literally overwrites everything with zeros. Look at that. So by saying fill, I have now immediately overwritten every single value inside of that array with the value that I give it. And I can pass in anything. I could pass in null. I could pass in uh, 42. I could pass in 100. Um, so. Yeah, it just overwrites everything in the array. Um, I honestly haven't used this that much um, in this scenario. This is typically used if like you're creating a new blank array of a given length, and then you want to make sure that um, 
uh, that array has values inside of it instead of undefined. Um, but it does, it modifies the array, right? It overwrites and it fills it with that given value. Pretty simple. Um, let's look up fill over here on MDN and see if there's anything I'm, I'm missing. Um, oh, you can also specify a start and an end. I didn't realize that, but that's really interesting. So instead of filling the entire array, you could say, I only want to fill from index 2 to index 3. And uh, this is very similar to slice in that this last index is uh, non-inclusive, right? So at index 0, 1, 2, uh, fill it with that value, and then um, at index 3, stop. So it's non-inclusive. But if we say, like, let's say go to 5, then it's only going to fill that specific section. Um, so yeah, we'll do that. And then we can see what it looks like just to fill the whole thing. All right. Uh, that's it for all of the, the modifying functions. I'm going to talk about at, because this is actually a, a newer function that's been added to the array prototype. And this lets you just uh, get a value at a given index. Now, uh, so let's say um, we're now we're dealing back with that numbers array because we haven't modified it. Uh, and let's say I want to grab that value 42. I could say numbers.at and then index 2 not flat, <laughs> numbers.at, flat is another thing, we'll talk about it another time, but numbers at 2, that gives us the value 42. Now, you may be wondering, well, why why don't I just use the uh, bracket operator, right? Because that's how you access values in an array. Um, sometimes you want to use a method. Um, and I don't know if there's anything uh, special about this. I guess this also can accept negative indices as well. So let's say I want the I want to get the third value from the end of the array. I could do negative three, and then you see that that grabs the uh, the sixth there because it's the third from the end of the array. You can't do that with bracket indexing. So if I do numbers at negative three, I just get undefined because um, you can't do negative indexing indexing with uh, with brackets. Cool. I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to open it up to chat so you can ask any questions or bring up anything that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, and we have talked about Splice and Slice, so you can you can go watch the YouTube video to uh, to see that. Okay, so yeah, we're going to open it up to chat. Um, is there anything you saw that um, you have questions about? Um, or things you think I should talk about that I did not talk about? Let me know. Yeah, and uh, Shwale is saying, uh, why not index of? Index of will give you back the index um, of a given item. I mean, it's, it's pretty kind of self-explanatory. But um, I actually talked about this in the last arrays video. So uh, if I say index of 1, that actually will search the array and give, give me the index of the first occurrence. So this actually returns 0 because that's the, um, the 0th index there. Yeah. <laughs> did some did somebody add this command recently, or that was just from a while back? Because that's hilarious. All right. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay. I guess we'll leave it at that. Thank you all for watching. Uh, this has been another edition of uh, Array Methods in JavaScript. Let's see uh, William's question really really quick. Uh, can splice both delete elements and add new ones at the same time? Yeah, I can. Actually, I didn't show that, and that's, that's a great question. So if you think back to uh, splice, where we are um, either inserting or removing items at a specific index, um, we can remove and add at the same time. So let's let's just see an example of that. So if I say numbers.splice, let's say I want to remove the value 42. So that's at 0, 1, 2. That's at index 2. Um, so remove uh, index 2. I want to remove one of them, but I want to insert uh, the value uh, 13 twice. Um, Uh, where I removed the 42. So now if, if we log numbers, uh, we can see that 42 got removed, but then it got replaced with those two that I'm inserting. So yeah, you can actually remove and add at the same time. Uh, I'm going to comment this out because I don't know if it, if it uh, affects any of the examples below, but yes, it is possible. Thank you for that question. Cool. Oh no, uh, uh, Kuduto, uh, J JavaScript has had most of these methods for a very long time. 
This video is kind of aimed at beginners that are newer to JavaScript. Um, although at is fairly new. Um, I don't know if it's, is it ES 2022, which we're actually going to talk about. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you all for watching. Uh, this has been fun. If you would like to see this happen live, please, please follow over on Twitch. Uh, you can ask questions in real time and uh, it's a fun time. So uh, thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people were coming in. No, I'm not leaving. I'm still, I'm here for another two hours, uh, but that is going to be clipped and uploaded to YouTube. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was fun. Um, we did it. I can't believe we did it. We, <laughs> that was, we, we, we talked about all of these really. Cool. Uh, is it weird that with uh, positive indexing, start is zero, but with negative index, indexing, end is one? Yeah. And actually, we saw that. Uh, I won't bring the code back up, but you saw that in the very last example where I did um, at negative three. Uh, it's not zero index from the back. So it's the third from the back, not, not counting zero. Um, so yeah. Yeah. My mustache went into the trash. <laughs> shaped it off and threw it away. Um, excuse me. That was fun. If you learned something, type one in chat. Um, Cause I feel like there are like nuances of some of these methods that you may have never used before. Even though you've used them, there's pieces of them that you haven't used before. I mean, I even learned something about, I forget which one it was, but I learned something. Great. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Yeah, and my mustache, no, actually, my mustache got spliced. Because slicing <laughs> would actually be a copy. But we removed, we removed the entire, uh, the entire mustache. Um, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, I, uh, I thought about doing, um, like, a subathon where, like, every 10 subs, I would remove, like, a centimeter of my mustache. But uh, I just I just ended up shaving it off. I don't think I could I could wait that long. And also, some of you all are mean enough that you would probably like remove half my mustache and then stop gifting. <laughs> but maybe we'll do that again in a year when my mustache is real long. Okay, uh, how long have I been live? Uh, about an hour. Let's take a quick three minute break, five minute break. Quick break, <laughs> quick break. Uh, but I'll, I'll actually, before we take the break, I'll leave you with the computer dictionary word of the day. And then when I come back, we're gonna talk about what is new in ES 2022. And I believe at is actually new in ES 2022. Okay, uh, someone give me a random number between uh, one and uh, 186. My mustache is not immutable, but it was. It's very immutable. 185. Ooh, okay. All the way to the end. So, uh, someone give me a random number between 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1 and 7. A random number between 1 and 7. 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Cool. Uh, and so this this is a little book that I got at a thrift store. It is the Webster's Pocket Computer Dictionary, uh, which has a copyright of 1997. So it's pretty outdated, though a lot of the definitions still hold up. Uh, so today's word of the day, or I mean, it's technically two words, is word wrap. A word processor program feature that enables text to overflow to the next line without a carriage return or to flow around a graphic element. Word wrap. Word wrap. <laughs> Um, so now it is uh, your responsibility to use the word word wrap in a sentence in the chat before the end of the stream. <laughs> word word wrap, yeah. <laughs> uh, and yaps, Stevie, thank you for that resub. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, this is the Webster's Pocket Computer Dictionary uh, of the English Language, the new revised edition from 1997. So I was in a thrift store like a week ago, and I found the same book but from the year 2001 um so that would be i i, I almost got it but i kind of like how outdated this is um like the i mean it's not even that outdated though because i looked up 
one of the last streams, the word of the day was IDE, but it wasn't integrated development environment. It was list. It's it was the the type of uh, disk drive that you could install in computers. These days, you normally use SATA. You don't really use IDE anymore. But I feel like back in 1997, IDEs were a thing. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good one, Interplanet Me. Pythons wrap around their prey like words wrap around in Notepad. Nice. Oh, wow. Sniper No Sniping says they program in a business language where there is no word wrap. Huh. Nice one. Uh, I love using Notepad++. It has so many features, even word wrap. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I agree with that user experience, uh, uh, Winston, who says, our UX designer has been hard on using word wrap instead of truncating when the line length is too long. I don't like it when a designer or a UX person wants us to do like uh, hyphenated words or to chop words off because it's not natural to read. Like your, your brain has to do more processing. Um, the flow of the UI sometimes isn't as good because if you have word wrap of a really long word, it might seem uneven. But I think just from a user perspective, word wrap is nicer. <laughs> nice, whoa, dude. That's very, very meta. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, so the schedule that has been released is the official one for this week. It might change for next week. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break. I'll leave you with the video while I'm on break. But when I come back, we're going to talk about ES 2022. Um, yeah. <laughs> What's up, Sobix? I'm here. I'm right here. I swear. Honestly, friend, I don't even know what word. <laughs> I get it. Let's see if we can if we can make it look. Yeah, like that. Honestly, friend, I don't even know what what her rap is. Nice. <laughs> um, here we go. We have a content playlist. I'll play you this three minute video while I'm gone. And this is, this, if you're new here, this is what I looked like. Actually, this was a lot more facial hair than I normally have. I had like a, an almost beard in a way. Um. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll be back in, uh, in, when this video is over, I'll be back. Uh, and you should probably stand up from your chair, take a drink of water. Um, all that good stuff. Um, that one. Video is unavailable? Okay. Hello friends, welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. In this short video, we're going to recreate the GameStop logo. So here I am on uh, the site CodePen where you can uh, create websites with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we're gonna start with an H1 tag. And inside of this H1 tag, we're gonna put the name GameStop. We should see it. There, there it is. But as you can see, the font isn't that great. We wanna make it the GameStop font. So what I'll do is I'll select the body and set the font family to be impact. Just like that, we're a little bit closer. I think the other thing we should do is increase the font size. So let's go to 69 pixels and see what we get. That's much better. Uh, also, let's center this on the page because it's, it's kind of like all over the place. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say uh, we're going to flex on them. The body's going to flex. Uh, we're going to justify it to the center. Uh, we're going to set the height to be 100 view height. So that makes it so that it takes up the full height of the viewport here, and then we're going to do align items of center, and we should get 
There we go. Nice, nice and in the center. Uh, the last thing we need is we need to make this red. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that in a separate element. So we're going to use a little span right here and wrap it like that. And then um, I'm going to give this a class of red. So I'm going to say class equals red. Um, and nothing happens because I have to create that class. So in my CSS, create a class called red, set the color to red. And there we go. We have the GameStop logo. Uh, a little bonus for you. Let's add some JavaScript. So what I want it to happen is when I click on GameStop, something should happen. So this, I'm going to write some JavaScript now that first selects the logo. So we'll do that like this. Uh, we want to grab that H1. And then when we click on it, so I'm going to add an event listener for a click. And when this happens, we want to do something right here. Um, and basically, I just want to change this red part here. So here's what I'll do. I'll create another variable called uh, the, the, the red part. <laughs> and this is going to be very similar. But instead of selecting the H1, we select the span like this. Great. And now we do the magic. So here's what we're going to do. Um, when you click on it, if the text content of that span is equal to stop, then I want to set its text content to be stock. Uh, otherwise, if it's stock, then I want to set it back to stop. So we'll put that here. And just like that, when I click, game stock, game stock. Game stuck. Uh, thanks for watching. If you like what you see, uh, check me out on Twitch. Follow here on YouTube. See you later. Hello? Hello? <laughs> I'm back, and I have uh, way less facial hair. <laughs> All right. Um, game stonk. You know what? I, f I feel like that's the case, too. Maybe we're on an alternate timeline, because I feel the same way, Vulture Bike. I feel, I feel like I, I did Game Stonk instead of Game Stock. Huh. Yeah, I'm not used to it either, Yap, but my, my partner likes it. It's the first time she's ever seen me without a mustache. Um... Oh, well, <laughs> let's, let's keep talking about stuff. So uh, if you're just joining us, uh, this is the coding garden. We talk about code. Um, we do a whole lot of JavaScript, though, every now and then. Um, we do other things. And I can say that because last stream, we wrote Java. We wrote Groovy. Oh, sorry. We wrote, did we? We also did uh, Rust. I don't know. But now we are going to talk about... Uh, What's new in ES 2022? <laughs> Can I recommend resources to learn design patterns? Um, I don't know of any, I don't have any recommended ones that I've personally read or looked at myself. Um, but if you search for JavaScript design patterns, there's actually some uh, like completely free uh, content out there, like on GitHub. That shows a lot of the design patterns implemented with JavaScript. So I'd recommend that. Um, I haven't released that YouTube short uh, mainly because I want to record it in a different way. Like it's way too... Um, so the way we recorded it last time was we just... We did this vertical layout and then we um, like cropped out everything except for this. And then this was like the YouTube short. But... The thing is, because this has to get cropped out and then rotated, um, it's way lower resolution. So what I actually need to do is I need to uh, rotate my entire scene so that it's recorded in uh, uh, 1080p and then rotate the video after the fact. Um, but, but we'll do that later. 
yeah, uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube eventually, uh, sooner than later. I still have a a bunch of videos I need to, or old streams I need to release on YouTube. Let's say two weeks. This video, this video will be on YouTube in two weeks. Um, all right, let's talk about ES2022. I need to find a list of ES2022 features. Um, uh, ES2022. Features. C-sharp corner? Medium? Hamanth? Log rocket? It's interesting, like there is, there, obviously there isn't any official thing because it really is just like, in order to get this list of list of features, someone had to look at the ES2022 spec and list out the, list out the features. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all these articles, make our own list, and then link over to the actual proposals. Unless somebody has uh, done that for us. Cool. Uh, yes. Uh, TC39 proposals. Thank you, Alka. <laughs> that's, that's what I need. <clears throat> and I believe they are, are they all issues or are they actual files in here? So if we look at uh, finished proposals, these are the ones that recently, um, or not recently, I guess they might be ordered by. Um, publication year. Hey, what year is it? It's 2022. So all of these are the ones that made it in. Huh. That's easy. It's funny that they do uh, expected publication year. Um, Because I, I do believe the, they were published in ES 2022. Honestly, that's just what I'm going to go by. I'm not even going to look at any of these articles. Um, I'm going to go w from the source. And um, what's nice is um, in a proposal, they actually include a lot of code examples. Yeah, top level of weight is there. Um, so if we go to the proposal... Um, Oh, we can see that this got merged into the class fields proposal. And we can see uh, examples. Custom elements with classes. I see. This is before, this is after. Um, class fields, and then the new feature is private fields with this little hashtag thingy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I finally got that, Alka. I was like, this doesn't look different. Oh, this is the after. Okay. Um, but what's cool is, like, every one of these proposals um, has examples like this. Yeah, and they got merged in there. Okay, so we'll pull up class fields, uh, regex match indices. Mmm. 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 Top level of weight. Actually, I mean, I honestly might want to make a slide deck from this. Because th this this is YouTube content, right? People want to know what's, what's new in ES 2022. Um... So yeah, then we've got top level of weight. So yeah, it talks about all the workarounds and such. And then the solution, which is just, uh, wait, what? what are they doing? Oh yeah, like they literally have a weight in use here. So this is top level of weight. Like this or like this, cool. Yeah, private fields have been released in ES 2022. Yep, yep. Uh, organic 
uh, erg, not organic, <laughs> organi- organic JavaScript, ergonomic brand checks for private fields. Let's see what this is about. Private field in object and method in object. Yeah, so this this kind of depends on private fields. Um, but the one of the main things about private fields is that you can't access them outside of um, the given class, even if you're dealing with an instance. Um, because they're private. This allows you to use the in keyword to see if that private property is in there. Um, I don't believe you can access it, at least without like reflection or something like that, but it does let you check to see if a private field is in a given object. So that's interesting. Uh, this is the one we looked at a second ago, uh, the at method. And their their main rationale is the ability to use uh, negative indexing, which I showed earlier doesn't work on bracket notation. Cool. Uh, this is a fun one, the has own property one. So, um, typically, if you want to do a safe check of if a given object has a given property, um, this is what you have to do. It's it's not safe to just do object bracket property name because you could you could um, run into things like um, uh, injection where someone like passes a property name of like constructor or something like that. Um, and it would still technically return true even though that's not a property of that given object. Um, and so this is what we had to do in the past. Now, uh, there's this new has own method built into the object. And uh, it's a lot simpler to instead of having to say object.prototype has own property and then call it on the given object. And the reason another reason that you do this is you don't just want to say object.has own property because object.has own property could have been overwritten or something like like it could have been overwritten elsewhere in your code. And by doing this, um, you're making sure that you're using the one from the actual object uh, and and from the like the object prototype and not from the instance of the object itself. Cool. Uh, what else? Class static block. without static blocks. Pranjal, uh, thank you for the 12 month resub. Uh, following you since Coding Train Meower app when I was in college, just love how far you've come and can't wait to see this community grow even bigger. Thank you, Pranjal, thanks for being here, appreciate you. Um, all right, what does the static block give us? We've got static properties. Um, oh, and then this. I see, I see. Hello, nothies. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We're reading about ES22 uh, new stuff, and then I'm going to try to do like a short video describing all of it. Um, okay. I think I get what's happening here. Um, with the static block... It allows you to do some initialization type code uh, with your static variables. And you wouldn't be able to do this in like a constructor because the constructor 
I guess if you wanted to access the prop the static properties in the constructor, you'd have to like reference it by, um, yeah, like like oh, like this. So uh, the by the actual class name itself, because that is the static property, and this just lets you access it directly with this inside of the static block. I get it. So inside of the static block, yeah, this references the class, not an instance of the class, the class itself. Yeah. Cool. Okay, and then uh, the last one is an error clause. Um, error clause. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the surface, it's pretty simple. You just pass in. So when you're creating an error, you pass in an object that has a cause. And then, um, let's see. The value of which will be assigned to the error instance as a property. So errors can be chained without unnecessary or over elaborate formalities. So you can throw the error with a cause and then multiple try catches later, you can still access that cause. Hmm. Okay. Right, and that's so that's a good point, Fun Planet. Is like um, that's why you wouldn't want to do um, this kind of code in a constructor because then every time you create an instance of that class, that same code would run, and you don't want that. But with the static block, it's only going to run once. Um. To, to use or or initialize those those static properties. Cool. All right. Um, let's make a video. I'm not going to create slides, but I'm going to do my best to um, to talk about each one of these, to zoom in on the code, and then um, I think I'll just have my own little editor. Um, if I want to try these things out. And I guess I can only try them out if I'm using like the latest version of Node. Um, so right now I'm on Node 16. Uh, I'm going to install the latest version. Um, let's see what the latest version is. 18, 18.4. Um, and then now we're using node version 18 and we'll see if node version 18 um, has some of these features in there. Cool. Uh, but Killer is asking the question, which one do I find the most interesting? Top level await. What's up, your boy? I sh it's gone. I shaved it off. <laughs> oh, thanks, Alka. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull that up as well. Uh, but yeah, top level await is great because you don't, I mean, I'll show in, in their example, like you don't have to do things like async ifies. Uh, it, it just makes the code simpler. Yeah. Um, that ES 2022 did not carry over. How do, how do I... Uh, Here we go. So in node 18.4, we can see that it pretty much supports everything um, from ES 2022. Um, yeah, if we look at the support table, does this show like Chrome Firefox? Um, map, 
dot prototype dot absurd. Ooh, ooh. Um. Here we go. Is there any way I can I can lock this top column? So this is cool because we can see um, with ES2022 features, so like what what is supported in Firefox. So uh, I am in Firefox version uh, 103. And uh, it, I mean, it's technically unstable because I'm on the dev edition. But if we look at this column and we look at ES2022, we can see that everything is supported. So that's cool. Um, but if you're running Chrome, um, probably 103 or one. Is that Chrome? Why do they have the same numbers as Firefox? When did that happen? And see you later, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks for hanging out. That's weird, isn't it? Um, regardless, we can see that Chrome, um, supports everything with partial support for regular expression match indices. Cool. So I'll keep those uh, open. And um, let's just talk. All right. Is everyone ready? <clears throat> um, I'm going to keep a timer going in the background because I don't want this to be more than like 20 minutes. Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go into focus mode as well. Oh, and thank you for the focuses. I, I, that's another thing I actually need to fix is um, uh, redemptions. Um, uh, which is asking about using a CDN instead of an NPM install. Um, are you asking... When would you use one over the other? Or what's better? What are you asking? I'll try to answer before we start this. <laughs> going once, going twice. Ask me after. Um, uh, focus and do I have plans on a fresh look in the future? <laughs> do you mean do you mean uh, not having a beard? Is that what you're asking about? Like, am I gonna keep it? I'm. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, uh, so which is asking what's better to use uh, a CDN or npm install? It really depends. I think if you have a larger application with a lot of dependencies, it makes a lot more sense to do like an npm install and then also to do a build so that um, all of those dependencies get bundled together. If it's a simple web page with just a couple, a CDN is fine. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the exact answer that Great, Grievan great Grievance gave. A CDN is simpler and great for basic static sites where you're not using NPM for anything else. Yeah, but if you have like a build process and stuff like that, then you should be using uh, NPM to install your dependencies. Oh, who asked about Fresh? What's up, Mr. Demon Wolf? <laughs> it's me! Um, but check out our friend Mr. Demon Wolf. He's a member of the Live Coders team as well. Room buttons. What do the rooms do, Alka? Yeah, you're welcome, Wichita. Tell me, tell me about rooms after after we talk about uh, um, uh, yes, twenty two. It'll put buttons for commands by your chat box. Oh. So 
So I can literally say like focus start, focus in, topics, and it'll give me buttons for all of those. Insane. Insane. Okay, I'll definitely set that up. Oh, <laughs> you were talking about D uh, Dino or Deno? Is it Deno? No, Dino, because it's like the dinosaur. Dino the dinosaur. Yeah. Uh, can I talk about ICS? Uh, are you talking about inversion of control systems? There's a thing from your camera at the top of the screen. Point, point to it. <laughs> oh, calendars. I see. So the ICS format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure, sure. I, but ICS is just a standard for calendar events, and most calendar software can read from it. What's up, uh, AS, ASD Pot? Welcome in. Okay, uh, let's let's do it. Let's talk about ES twenty twenty two. Actually, let me update my my Twitch title. And away. Wait, no, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Now. <laughs> Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden. I'm CJ, and today we're going to talk about what's new in ES 2022. Before we do that, I'm going to give you a quick primer on the TC39, the Technical Committee 39, and uh, what it means for, for us to have an ES 2022. So, um, all of the features that exist in ECMAScript, which is the standard that defines JavaScript, um, have all started in, I guess, in recent years as proposals. So essentially someone will say, hey, I think it'd be a good idea if arrays had the at method in ECMAScript, which in turn in JavaScript would be in JavaScript. So that person would write a proposal to say, hey, this method should exist. This is how we did it before. This is the benefits it would provide. And then that pro proposal would get published as a uh, a stage zero proposal, um, meaning um, it doesn't have any implementations yet. There's no, um, there might be, I think, one person on the committee backing it, but it's fresh. Um, and then web browsers and engines like Node.js or uh, uh, I guess the V8 engine um, or uh, what does Firefox use? Is it Spider Monkey or something like that? But all of these different JavaScript engines would then see these proposals and potentially implement them already. So even though uh, these features haven't been released in the language yet, uh, various engines will implement those features and uh, people can start to experiment, experiment with them and start to use them and, and see whether or not they're a good thing. And then eventually, after uh, it's gotten a lot of good feedback and a lot of engines have actually implemented it, then it becomes, um, it moves through the stages, uh, stage zero, one, two, three, I don't know all the specifics of them, but if it makes it to stage four, that means the majority of people have agreed that this is a good feature, the majority of engines have implemented it, and it will be listed in the next ECMAScript version. And at this point, we're getting a new ECMAScript version uh, every single year. Um, so there was ES uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, etc. We are now in the year 2022, so we have ES 2022. Um, so if you were uh, searching the web, what's new in ES 2022, and you came across people's articles, and you're like, how do they know? How do they know what's in there? They got it from this GitHub repo. So if we go to this repo, we can actually see things that might make it into ES 2023 or 2024. But if we click on finish proposals, we can see the things that have made it into ES 2022 and we can talk about them from there. So if we scroll all the way down in this table, we can see all of these features um, that are listed as a, a published date of 2022, which means they're gonna make it into the 2022 specification. Whew. Okay, all that out of the way, let's talk about it. So the very first one is uh, class fields. So private instance methods and accessors, uh, class public instance fields and private 
instance fields, static class fields, and private static methods. What does this mean? Well, let's look at the proposal. So, um, and excuse me. <laughs> But uh, every proposal typically already has code examples in it. So we'll see um, uh, how we do things today and then what their proposal is for how we would do them in the future if this proposal got accepted and then implemented. Um, and specifically, this one talks about private fields. So classes have existed in JavaScript since ES 2015. Um, and then I believe, I don't actually don't know which ES version got it, but we have had uh, class fields, which let us basically declare um, not private properties, but just properties for our given class. And this is saying we should be able to do private properties, which we haven't been able to do directly in the past. There hasn't been syntax for it. Technically, you could do private fields with like a closure, but there was no like language way of doing it. And this is the proposal that has made it in. So you declare a private field with the octothorpe, the number sign, the, the hashtag. So hashtag X uh, means that this is a private field, meaning outside, uh, of this class, you actually cannot access that field. You can only access it from within this specific class. Um, and so now JavaScript has private fields, so that's pretty great. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I, the, to me, the syntax is weird. It's like, I don't, I don't like the syntax. Like, why couldn't I just use the private keyword? But they, they have their reasons for doing so. Um, and uh, that's what we got. <laughs> so now, if you wanted to declare uh, private fields in your classes, you can just use the pound sign. And now those uh, values will not be accessible outside of the class. Uh, let's actually just show an example of that. So I have some code here. I'm going to declare a class animal. And this is going to have a private field called um, age because um, we don't want people knowing their age or being able to access their age outside of it. So let's say we have a constructor that takes in the age. We can then say uh, this dot age equals age like that. Um, and we can create an instance of an animal. So I can say uh, dog will create a new animal. It has an age of seven. But if I try to access age, it will not work. I cannot, I mean, I even get a syntax error, but let's try running this code really quick. Um, I'll tell you that I am using node version 18.4. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, various engines will implement these features. And at this point, node version 18.4 has actually implemented all of the ES2022 features. So because I'm using this version of node, I'll be able to, to use this private field stuff. Um, and if you want to figure out what is supported, this website is great, Node Green, and you can actually see that Node version 18.4 supports everything from ES 2022. Um, I'll link this in the description. And then also, if you want to know what web, 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 what web browsers support, you can look at this uh, website, the Kangax support table. And so we can see, for example, I'm running Firefox version 103, and we can see that it actually supports all of these features, including private class uh, fields and methods, which I'm about to show. Um, and then if you look at uh, Firefox, which is uh, this column, it supports everything and then has partial support for Reg regex match indices, which we'll talk about in a second. So uh, that was just a quick aside. I know that this is going to work because I'm using Node version 18.4. Okay, so if I run this code, um, I just get a syntax error. So private field age must be declared in an enclosing class. Like I can't, I can't even access it. Like if I do dot age, I get undefined. There is no way for the outside world, so things outside of this class, to access that age property. Um, but if I create like an accessor method, like uh, get age, um, this thing could return this dot uh, pound age. And so. I can access pound age inside of the class, but not outside. So if I did want to get access to it, I would have to say dog.getAge like this. And then if I run the code, I get the value seven. So that's what uh, private provides us with. It, you basically can define things that cannot be accessed outside unless there's some sort of like accessor method. Uh, yeah, and, and that's a good uh, a good try, uh, fun planet. So let's let's try doing it. So if we do dog, not dag, dog bracket, and then I want this, let's see what we get. 
undefined. So there's no way, no way, um, uh, except for uh, accessor methods. Though you probably could use the reflection API. Uh, we're not we're not going to do that. Get into that though. And yeah, um, uh, a supervisor is asking, do we have to declare this outside of the constructor? You actually don't. So um, the really the only reason you would do this is if you want to give it like a default value like this, and then you wouldn't have to ha even have a constructor. So now this gives us forty two. But if I didn't declare the field like that, this would still work because. We're still in JavaScript. We can still define things at, like define properties on a whim, and that's kind of what's happening here. So this should give us the uh, oh, I guess not. I guess not. I, I'm proven wrong. So private field must be declared in an enclosing class. So you actually do need this. I was wrong. <laughs> um, it's good to know though. So if you want those private properties, you have to define them. Uh, the other thing is you can define private methods as well. Um, so if you do something like super secret method. Um, this is going to be a private method that can only be accessed in, inside the class. Um, I could say something like uh, only called inside the class. You can't access it directly. Um, and so now, uh, outside here, if I tried to do something like dog dot super secret method, um, a super secret method is not a function. Again, I could try with the with the pound. I'm not going to be able to access it. But if I am inside of the class, I can access it. So let's say inside of our accessor method get age, I could do this dot super secret method. That'll work. We're going to see this console log, but this can only be called from inside of the class. And because I'm calling get age, it can access it inside of that. It can call the super secret method. So yeah, only called inside the class. Okay. So that's it for private methods and private fields. Pretty useful, uh, especially if you're doing a lot of OOP and you want to encapsulate things. Basically, like this is a huge thing in object-oriented programming where you're hiding implementation details from the outside world so that the only way they can interact with your class is through publicly exposed methods and properties. So yeah, all right, let's keep going. Uh, the next one up is regular expression match indices. Now. We're going to have to read this this proposal just a little bit because I don't know exactly what it does, but we can try and see some examples of it. Um, cool. So today, ECMAScript regex objects can provide information about a match when calling the exec method. This result is an array containing information about the substrings that were matched along with the additional properties to indicate the input string. OK. Um, I think I know what they're talking about here. So let's say um, I have. Uh, a string. I'm just going to call it value because I don't want don't know what I'm going to put inside of it yet. Actually, I do. I'm going to put a phone number. And if I say like five 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 five, <laughs> and I want to create uh, like a, a regular expression match matching group. If I did phone number dot exec, uh, a regular expression that um, let's say. I want a matching group for the first thing of parentheses. So uh, digit, 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 close parentheses, escape that. So this is going to match three digits inside of parentheses. Um, let's see what this gives us. I mean, it should give us, uh, it'll say index one is 5555 five, 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 because that's the first matching group. Uh, phone number .exec is not a function. I did it wrong. So you you have to exec on a regular expression. So if I do regular ex expression regular expression exec on a phone number like that. All right. Let's take a quick stretch. Uh, and Timon is asking, what about extending classes? So if I were to, this goes back to the previous feature. If I were to extend animal, could I access the private properties? I don't know. I'm going to guess n no, but maybe. Let's try it. <laughs> so let's say we have a class, uh, human. Yeah, people are telling me you can't, but let's see an example of it. So if I have a class human that extends animal, um, let's say in my constructor, I want to log. Um, 
Oh, well, first I'll call super with age. And then uh, I want to log this dot age. Property age is not accessible outside class animal because, because it has a private identifier. So you can't. You cannot. Um, I would say, like in other programming languages like Java or C sharp, you can use the protected keyword. And protected means um, classes that extend or inherit from this class can access them, but it cannot be accessed by the outside world. I don't believe we have the protected. We don't. We don't have protected in JavaScript, as far as I know. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we'll come across something uh, that tells us um, how to do protected. But yeah, for now, no. OK, back to uh, regular expression indices. So let's say we have this phone number. And let's say I have a regular expression that will match uh, three digits um, inside of parentheses. And I'm going to execute that on the phone number. Let's see what we get. So you can see that we get back an array. And then um, at index 1, which is the first matching group, um, we get that. Though actually, you know, to really see this, let's run this in an older version of Node that doesn't support this um, to see what the output used to be. So for instance, if we look at, um, I think Node.js is in, I guess I can look at this. Um, we want to find the regular expression one, this, and then we want to see the first version that doesn't support it, um, which would be version 15.14. So I'm going to switch to version node version 15.14 and see what happens. Um, so I'm going to install version 15. I'm using a tool called NVM, which is Node Version Manager. It makes it really easy to switch between node versions. Uh, OK, so now I'm using Node version 15. Now, if I run this code, the private field stuff breaks. Or it should. Maybe not. Um, I guess I was mistaken. So if I look at Node version 15, um, oh, look at that. Node version 15 did support uh, private class methods and private um, uh, instance fields. Cool. So Node 15 supported that stuff, but it did not support the regex stuff. So um, does the output look any different? So this is the output from um, Node 18, and then this is the output from Node 15. It looks the same. Let's read further into the proposal to try and understand what's happening. Um, indices are relative to the start of the input string. So this is a proposal where we actually don't see the before. Let's let's run it. I have an idea. We're going to run it on a string that um, does not have does not match the group. So if we just run this on the empty string, um, let's see let's see what the output looks like. Null. Um, however, if we run this. On version 18, we still get null. Well, <laughs> let's use version 15. Error, error, error. Oh, it literally gives us an indices property. I see. Right? Right?
All right, so in, uh, in node version 15, um, there is no indices property. However, I mean, I guess like if it was giving us back null before, then um, we might actually have to check for if it's not null. Good call, fun planet. Slash D. Why use slash D for the regex flag? We chose D due, due to its presence in the world. All right, scratch everything I've said so far. We're not actually doing it yet. If And it gets confusing with my regular expression because this is a different slash D. This is a, a slash D um, on the end of the regular expression, which would go here. Let's see what this gives us. Nice. Nice. Okay, so if I add slash D as a flag, that gives us access to the indices property, and um, I can I get the indices where uh, the thing that I was looking for was found, and so this would be indices zero through five. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, and, that, and five is not inclusive of the group. Um, great. Uh, if I make this regular expression uh, a little more complex, so find three digits inside a parentheses followed by a space followed by three digits followed by four digits and if i put these in parentheses that means it's a matching group like that um that goes there this is extra all right let's see what we get here um zero to five 6 to 9, 12 to 16. So that's each of the the groups. And then 0 to 16, I guess, is because it matches the entire the entire string. OK, good to know. Now, um, if I do this, so right now we, we just ran this in node 18, and it works. If I do this in node 15, um, we should get an error. So I'm going to do nvm use 15. And the error we're going to get is that this slash D is like a syntax error. It doesn't know, I, I believe it doesn't know what to do with that slash D. Let's see. So if we run this now, yeah. Invalid regular expression flags. Okay, so before, uh, so version 15 and older, you cannot use this slash D. And then uh, any version after that, you can use the slash D. And um, that gives us that indices property. When is it going to be useful? Um, let's let's try to talk about that next. So nvm use eighteen. Uh, run the, run the code. Um, let's store this in a variable, and let's see what we get. Yeah, and then we don't even need the uh, the indices property there. Um, it's useful because before we didn't get that information. So before, all we had access to were these properties. Oh, actually, we didn't. I don't think we had groups either. We can look earlier when I was logging. So we did have groups. So before, without slash slash d, this is all you get. And you get the, you get the pieces that matched. So. Um, a regular expression result bracket one, so the first matching group would give us this because that's the first group that matched. Bracket two would give us this, and bracket three would give us this. But that doesn't give us the specific indices in the input string that match that specific group. And so that's why this is useful because now I know that um, the first group was matched from zero to five, non inclusive, and the, the next group was matched from six to nine. Um, and then the next group was matched from 12 to 16. So th that's why it's useful is I now have these specific indices in the input string where that group was matched. Whereas before, all we got was the matching group itself. So that's why it's useful. Um, yeah. 
Capture groups that are not matched return undefined. Cool. And so, like, if we had a regular expression that was matching a group that it didn't find, we would have gotten undefined. And that actually um, is interesting because if we run the same regular expression um, on an empty string, because we use slash d, I think we will get back a result instead of null. That's my guess. Let's see. Um, so I'm going to put this regular expression in a variable so we can reuse it. If we execute it on a phone number that's in the right format, we're going to get back um, the, the specific groups. But if we execute it on an empty string, let's see. My guess is we don't get back null because then that'll tell us that the groups are empty. We get back null. I was wrong. <laughs> I don't know how that's useful then. Um, what is their RE1 in their example here? A followed by a group of Z's, which is optional. And I guess this does match because there is an A. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, so that actually wasn't useful there. Oh, well. It's nice to have the indices. That's all I'll say about that. I think we talked about that for way too long. Let's keep moving. Um, a named capture group? OK. The takeaway from this is you now have this uh, slash D um, flag. So if, if you're familiar with regular expressions in JavaScript, there's like slash I, which is a case insensitive match. There's a slash G, which is a global match. Now we have this new flag, which is slash D. And that says, uh, I want to get back the indices of the groups in the result. And so by adding slash D there, now in our result, we get access to the specific indices of the given matches. So that's why it's useful. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, the next new feature is top level await. So this one is my favorite and one of the most useful. Basically, it allows you to use await at any level uh, of your code. Um, it doesn't have to be inside of an async function. So if you're at the top level, you can use await and um, good to go. Uh, now, if you look in Node.js, uh, top level await, I think it might have to be inside of um, uh, a module. So it has to be declared as a module. Let's see. Top level await isn't listed there. Uh, Merch Real is asking, do I think desktop IDEs will lose popularity and cloud base will take over? I don't know. Um, more people might use them because uh, it's possible like we'll get less powerful devices and then we don't have to depend on the power of the device to be able to edit stuff. We can just edit it in the cloud. I think like it is useful, especially for like pre set up development environments. Um, I don't know if it's gonna. It, yeah, I don't think it's going to completely replace regular IDEs. Does anyone see top level await? Why am I missing it? Hmm. The vid I'm going to have to edit this video. Yeah, I know I'm taking a long time. <laughs> We talked way too long about regular expressions. I just I just couldn't figure out what it was adding. But we figured it out. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, here's an article on how to use top-level await in Node. Um, it's only available in ES modules. And to use modules, you have to say type module. Um,
but how did you know that? <laughs> like, it's not listed on this. Um, listed on this table. What's up, Sir Goldman? <laughs> Oh, well, um, do we have access to fetch, um, in node 18? This will be a good example of, of that. Uh, JSON response.json and log the JSON. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So even though I'm in no, uh, not no, <laughs> I'm in node version 18, um, I still can't do it because I have to use it as a module. All right. We'll do that now. Okay, uh, we're gonna actually. I will take a uh, a quick break to not break, but um, I'll answer any questions that you have so far. But we're gonna go back into focus mode so I can keep talking about this stuff. So, what questions do you have? Um, like so far, we've talked about uh, private stuff, uh, private methods and fields, um, and we've talked about regular expressions. Is that all we've talked about? It took me thirty minutes to talk about two things. <laughs> It is. That is all we've talked about. <laughs> um, uh, no await after await for two cons. Well, the, the main thing about top level await is um, you don't have to put things inside of like an async function or an async uh, iffy. Yeah. Uh, Timon says your last question. Let's see what you got. Uh, can you go back to classes for a second and test if private static properties are a thing? <sighs> Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not complaining about this index. You can have a static private field <laughs> to answer your question, Timon. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and if you're not familiar with static, actually, we're, we're going to get to static blocks later on. So we'll 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 talk about static more in depth. And uh, some antics. Thank you for that raid. Yeah. So you can create singletons with private static fields <laughs> in JavaScript. Uh, I'm going to remove that sample code from now because we will we'll talk about static properties and static blocks in a little bit. What's up, Opti? I have no facial hair. Yeah, this is the new me. <laughs> okay, uh, Danif, thank you for that 15 months. Blanks, thanks for the 11. And, and some antics dev, thank you, thank you for the raid. Uh, what were you working on? Um, let's see. Accessible components with state machines and zag. What is zag? Zag.js, UI components powered by finite state machines. Cool, looks fun. Welcome in Raiders. Uh, we're talking about ES 2022. So, so far we talked about private um, fields and private methods. We talked about uh, this new indices property in uh, regular expressions, uh, this, which is nice. So if you have matching groups, it's going to give you back the specific matching indices in the input string. And now we're talking about top level await. So that's going to be fun. Um, 
Yeah, I've heard of X date as well. That that's what it reminded me of. Yeah. Cool. Um, I do need to take a quick two minute bio break, but when I come back, we're going to talk about top level of weight. Um, I don't know if there's any short video I can leave you with. Um, coding garden speed run, maybe. All these videos are too long. Um, it's fine. I'm going to leave you with this one. And I'll be back like halfway through the video. Pop up. Two times speed. <laughs> I'm, I'm already going really fast. Um, cool. But yeah, I'll be back in six minutes. Uh, in the meantime, here is past CJ with a goatee and a mustache. Uh, see you soon. Worst code katas as possible within an 11 minute. Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Uh, welcome to this challenge video where I'm going to attempt to complete as many 7Q Code Wars Code Katas as possible within an 11 minute time limit. This is our break timer. We're just getting started. If you're sitting at home, you've been watching YouTube all day, just take a stretch, take your hands off the keyboard, prepare to uh, write some code. Um, so if you're new to the Code Wars website, uh, the difficulty ranges from 8Q, which is very easy, all the way up to 1Q, which is very hard. We're going to be in the 7Q range, which is fairly easy but a little bit harder than totally easy. <laughs> Let's get started. Uh, I'm gonna start with this one, which is alternate capitalization. Oh, and we'll start the timer now. <laughs> so this says, given a string, capitalize the letters that occupy even indexes and odd indexes separately. The return as shown below. So index zero will be considered even. So if it's an even index, it should be capitalized. If it's an odd index, it should be lowercase. So um, typically, if you tune into the code katas series on my channel. Uh, I solve them in multiple ways and I try to solve them in a beginner friendly style. However, I've already wasted 30 seconds. So we're going to power through it. So I'm going to do uh, s.split. So I'm going to turn this uh, string into an array and then I'm going to map over each individual character. So let's call that C for character. Uh, and then we also have the index. Um, and I can just check. So I can say if uh, the index mod two. So if the remainder of the division by two is equal to zero, then that means it's even. And in that case, we want to do C dot two uppercase. Uh, otherwise we do C dot two lowercase. And then we send that whole thing. We're going to join because it's an array. We're going to join it back together, um, back to a string and that should do it. I'm going to write it like this. So it's a little bit easier to read. Um, let's see. Test. Failed. Expected. Oh, I see. We need to do it both ways. We need to do it both ways. We need to do it the first way and the second way. So, I mean, technically what I could do is, yeah, it's a nice error. So <laughs> great start. <laughs> technically I need an array where the first one is um, that. And then the, the second one is the same thing, but with the opposite logic. So if, if the remainder is not equal to zero, then we, we flop it around. Yeah, look at that. Now, that took us two minutes. I could refactor this. In the real world, I would. I would put this in a separate function, but that's all I'm going to do for now because we got to keep moving. So that did it. Great work, everyone. One down. One down. <laughs> all right. Final submission. Let's go. Go. Please go. All right. Moving on. Um, next one is remove duplicate words. So this one says, your task is to remove all duplicate words from a string. Leave only single first word word entries. So for example, alpha, beta, 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 gamma, delta, whatever. And then we end up with alpha, beta, gamma, delta. All right, let's go. <laughs> Flip it, flop it, bop it, bip it. So uh, what, we, what I want to do is I want to keep track of words that we have seen, seen. Um, and I'm going to put that into a set. A set is a nice data structure. Uh, it only has unique items inside of it. And we can check to see if a unique, unique item is already in there. Uh, we're going to split this, um, split this, <laughs> 
uh, sentence in two words uh, by splitting it on a space. So when I split on a space, that turns the sentence into an array of words. Um, and then we're going to look at each individual word. Um, and actually, I'm just going to run a filter. So I'm going to filter over the words. And if we have not seen a word before, then it will uh, show up in the resulting sentence. But if we have seen it before, it will not show up. So this is going to give us each individual word. And I will do like so. I'll say if seen dot has the word, then we return false. Otherwise, we'll say seen dot add, I think. I'll have to look up wh how it works with a set. So add the word and return true. Um, and then we need to just join this whole thing back together on a space. Um, yeah, I think that would work too, Andrew. I like that solution. But let's look at a, a set on MDN. Is it add? Does anybody know? Is it set? Set dot set? What's the method? Set dot add. I did it right. Great work, everyone. <laughs> and if I've done it right, yes. First try. Submit. Submit. This, I, I, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> All right, next one is called greet me. Um, and this one says, uh, write a method that takes one argument as a name and then greets that name, capitalized and ends with an exclamation point. So for example, um, we get in a name and we have to say hello name with exclamation. However, you'll notice that we have to uh, lowercase it and uppercase the first word. So that's, that's the tricky part of this problem. Let's try it. So um, let's... Just say uh, proper name <laughs> is going to be uh, name dot two lowercase. Actually, we'll do this. So I want to take the first letter. So name at bracket zero. That's going to give me the first letter in the name, and I want to two uppercase it. So capitalize the first letter in the name, and then on the end of it, I'm going to take the all of the, the rest of the name except for the first character so I, sh I could do name dot slice one so that will um, remove the first character from the string return a new string and then I want to to lowercase it like that so that should be the proper name and then I just want to return in this case I'm going to use a template function so I can say hello proper name did I spell proper name right proper name like that Test. Uh, so that worked for the basic ca test case. Does it work for everything? It does. So final submission. Um, all right, we have five minutes left. We're doing pretty good. It's not so bad. All right, this one says it's called predict your age. All right, I'm back. Um, I'll, I'll link this video in the chat if you want to finish it out, but um, or will I? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's old CJ. This is new CJ. I feel like my skin color looks better, but I think that was just the lighting. I don't know. But here we go. Let's uh, let's get back into talking about ES 2022. Um, and thank you all for being here. Okay. Um, what did I want to do? Oh, yeah. I was going to link that video. Um, this one. If you want to watch it. Also, if you want to uh, sub on YouTube, if you haven't. Check it out. All right, we're getting back into it. And now we're going to talk about top level await. Um, now, in all of their examples, they are putting it inside of an MJS file. Um, and so that's what we're going to need to do. Oh, yeah, good call. Thank you. Let's turn that topic off. Um, cool. All right, we're going to go back into focus mode. Also, um, I saw some more people saying hello, and I don't think I, I, I got to acknowledge them. So, um, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, what's up, David? Namaste, Geek, Interplanet Me, Staskly, uh, Swagopotamus, Sir Davos, Gazan, um, Hasomic, Daddy Ray, what's up? Uh, Sadpa. Kim, hello Kim, thanks for being here. What's up, Andreas? D Rocks, Ted Talks, I'm heck, Sir Goldman, Xerxex. Hello. <laughs> Welcome here. Um Oh, Mewtwo, what's up? Thanks for being here. Yeah, shout out to our friend Mewtwo. Click that link, drop a follow. Um 
Not much. We're talking about ES 2022 today. It has been a long time. Yeah, I mean, I this is the first time I've streamed on a not Friday in like a year, over a year probably. So, um, cool. Let's keep going. We're going to talk about uh, top level await. Here we go. All right, this next feature is top level await. Like I said, uh, my favorite new feature. Um, but basically what this allows you to do is to use await at the top level of a module or the top level of a script file if you're running in the web browser. Um, and we could look at their examples. Honestly, they seem a little bit confusing, so I'm just going to show you some examples here. Now. Uh, in the before times, uh, if I wanted to do stuff with the a await keyword, I would need to define it on an async function. So let's say async uh, get reddit posts. So this is going to be an async function, um, async function that does await type things. So I could say uh, response equals await fetch, um, and then I need to specify where I want to fetch fetch from. I'm just going to go from reddit r slash javascript dot json. Great, so that's going to make the request. Um, and then we'll get back the JSON by parsing the response. And then now we should have uh, the JSON itself. OK, so if I run this method get Reddit posts, um, that will make the request out to Reddit. It'll await it, so it'll wait for that request to finish. And then after the request comes back, it'll parse it as JSON. It'll wait for that parsing to finish. And then we have the, the result there. So let's run the code. Um, and I mean, we get this error about fetch being an experimental feature. Ignore that. Ignore the fact that we're using fetch. Just focus on the fact that we're using the await keyword. And this works wonderfully. Great. Um, However, it is sometimes inconvenient that I had to put it inside of its own function here. Wouldn't it be great if I could actually just write my code like this and not have to put it in a function, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, well, now you can, and that's what top level await means. So instead of having to put it inside of an async function, you can do this. Now, the, the workaround for that uh, right, right now before top level await was to put it inside of an async, uh, async iffy async immediately invoked a uh, function expression. So we define an async function in line, and then we immediately invoke it like this. So this is the async iffy way, where I don't have to declare a separate method and then call it. I can just do it all in one go. This will work in the same way, like that. Great. Um, but now, even better, is I don't need that async iffy. Now I can just do it. However, it's not going to work immediately because I you can only do this from inside modules, so I'll show you how to do that. Um, but now I can write my code like this, and then when I run it, I get an error, but that's because I'm not inside of a module. Uh, and so actually, if I move this uh, file to a file called uh, mjs, which stands for module.js, um, now that I'm in a module, um, I can uh, use top level await. Let's take a quick stretch. Yeah, and root privilege is asking, do you still need the await keyword? Yeah, yeah. So you like uh, fetch still returns a promise. Re Response.json still returns a promise. So I still need the await keyword. However, it doesn't have to be wrapped inside of a um, async function. And I accidentally just recreated this JS. Let's get rid of the JS. Now we're in this MJS one. Um, and it should work. Let's see if it works. Nice. So now we have top level await. Um, super convenient. Uh, if you're in the web browser, you don't have to do this .mjs thing. In, in, if I'm just in a web browser, um, it'll actually just work. And I can show an example of that. Like if I go to a blank page and open up the, the dev tools here, um, I can just throw this in. Boom, it worked. Await works at the top level. Um, and we, we pointed to this earlier, but if you look at the support table, you can see that. Uh, so I'm running Firefox version 103, and if we look at Firefox, I totally forgot that uh, top level await is not in this uh, table. So ignore what I just said. However, um, it is supported in Chrome. It's supported in Firefox. So you can do this, this top level stuff. It's pretty convenient. Um, what, what the proposal also talks about is being able to do uh, top level awaits for like module imports. 
Um, so for example, like using the uh, import method um, to like dynamically import resources as you need them. In that case, you can also do a top level await, which is pretty cool. Sweet. All right, let's keep moving. Um, next, we're going to talk about ergonomic brand checks for private fields. So uh, a little bit ago, we talked about uh, classes and the fact that you can define uh, now private fields and private methods. Um, but uh, if you're working with classes like this and you want to check if a given instance has a given private method or a private property, um, before this proposal, there was no easy way to do that. Um, and now there is the in keyword. So if we look at uh, this ergonomic brand checks for private fields, we can see that um, um, we can access the private property. And I guess um, that makes sense because classes can access private properties of, of other instances of that class. Let's see an example of that. So um, let's say our animal also gets a name. And then we have a method on here that says, uh, say hello. And then we pass in some other animal. And we want to just log out. Um, Something like, hello, other animal dot name. You technically can do this. So now um, we're going to create this animal that has the name uh, pig. So it's a dog named pig. Um, but then if we create another animal, which is going to be a 13 year old cat named dog. Uh, and if we say dog dot say hello to cat, um, it should say hello dog. Uh, and I'm going to comment out my, my fetch code for now because it takes a long time. Um, private field name must be declared in a closing class. I need to fix that. So um, you can't just willy nilly define private fields. You need to make sure that you define them there before you use them. Okay. So we asked the dog to say hello to the cat, and it was able to access that property. It was able to say uh, instance dot name, right? Um, and that's because this other animal was an instance of animal. If we tried to do this same thing inside of another class that doesn't have access to these private properties, then we would get an error. But because this object is of type animal, we can access its private properties inside of here. Great. but um, what if someone passed in an object that was not uh, an animal? So if we did something like dog say hello to just some object and that object is not an instance of animal, we get an error. Um, cannot read private member name from an object whose class did not declare it. So because um, this is just an object, it's not an instance of animal, um, we, we can't access it. And I guess technically, yeah, I think if we created an instance of a human, with the name, oh, actually, but just, just the age, 77. Um, and I guess we can pass in a name here too. It technically works, and that's because human is of type animal. So inside of here, we can't access that private property. Um, but this this is the, the this is the one that causes the error. Okay. If we look at their proposal, they were mentioning that typically the way you would actually do this is with a try catch because. Um, it's possible that the thing that gets passed in is not of that type. And so you would um, catch it in case it wasn't that type. So you don't get that error. Um, but that's a little bit cumbersome to have to do a try catch like that. And so uh, the new way of doing it 
is the in keyword. So you can say uh, if uh, this property is in this object, then do the thing. So, um, and actually right now, right now the code throws an error. Um, I could fix it with a try catch. Like basically I would wrap this in a try catch and then do something if it, if it caught. But instead of that, I can just do this. So if name is in other animal, then say hello. Um, otherwise we can do something like, um, can't say hello to a non-animal. Go away. So now instead of throwing an error like this, uh, we get this if we pass in something that doesn't have that private field. Uh, so that's useful, this little uh, in, in thing. Um, and w one interesting thing about these proposals is that it talks about like what the actual solution is and what other things that could have been. So if other people liked it, it could have been that we had a try keyword instead of an in keyword. Um, I'm guessing they didn't go with that because it would like interfere with try catch and like parsing. Um, I, I like the in keyword, it's pretty cool. So yeah, you could actually, I believe you could do instance of, yeah, you're totally right, David. So like you could do the try catch. The other way is you could say uh, if other animal uh, instance of uh, animal um, then uh, grab their name. Cool, and that and you can see that even worked for the human. So the human with the name CJ was technically of type human, but human inherits or extends from animal. So uh, this worked as well. So that, I guess that's another way to do it. Um, it is just interesting to have this like floating private name in object. I don't know, seems fine. Let's keep going. Um, the next one is uh, the at. Method. So we actually talked about this earlier when we were looking at uh, array methods. Um, but here it is, and it is called the proposal for an at method on all the built-in indexables. So actually, it's not just on arrays. Um, I misspoke earlier. You, on anything that is indexable. So a string, an array, and typed arrays are all indexable in JavaScript but we get this new at method. Um, and what's nice about it is you can use negative indexing. So let's just show an example of that. So for example, if I have some numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and I wanna get the value at index zero, I can say numbers.at zero. And if I run this code, we get one down there because that is the thing at index zero. If I do the thing at index four, we should get five because that's the thing at index five. Easy. Uh, you might be wondering, well, I can already do that. I can use bracket notation. Uh, you can, but I'll show you one cool thing about uh, the at method. So if I do this and we use bracket notation, uh, that'll work in the same way. So we get one, one, five, five, great. Uh, but you can use negative indexing. So if I say I want the number that is two from the back, that's gonna give me four. So if I do negative two, I'm actually gonna get back four. Like that, awesome. Um, and so that's really useful. Uh, I guess the other thing is um, uh, you can do it on strings as well. It's not just for ar arrays, you can use it on strings. Um, so if I say name at, uh, Zero, one, two, three, and three, we should get the letter T. Yep, there it is. Um, or if I do name at negative three, that's gonna be uh, the letter D, like that. Cool, so uh, at, super useful, especially if you wanna get things from the end of the array. And yeah, and um, this, this makes a really good point. In the past, if we wanted to get the last item in the array, you always had to do array.length minus one. I have like the, I have so much code where I had array.length minus one. Um, it's everywhere. And now you don't have to do that. You can just do dot at negative one, 
save a few characters. This is actually going to be really useful for uh, like Clash of Code in shortest mode because um, you can grab the uh, the last the last element in the array with a negative one. Yeah. How does it respond to an index larger than the length? I'm assuming undefined. That's what I would, what I would assume. But let's try it. So if we do name uh, at 42. I'm guessing we're going to get back undefined. Yeah, undefined. And uh, so that's on a string. If we do the same thing uh, on, on a number, uh, 99, it gets undefined. Yeah, so it doesn't throw an error. It just says there's nothing at that index. Yep. Cool. So that's the at method. Uh, next up, we've got the accessible object.prototype.has own property. Um, so let's talk about this. Um, so in the past, if you wanted to check if an object had some given iterable property, meaning like it existed on that object, it didn't, it doesn't exist in the prototype chain, meaning it doesn't exist on some object that, that this object inherited from. Does this specific object have that property? You typically would have to do this. Um, you say object.prototype.hasOwn property, and then you use the call method and you pass in the given object that you care about as the instance of the this keyword. So that you pass in the instance, and then you're asking it for a given property. Um, let's see this in action. Um, so if you remember, actually, we have uh, we have the human. Where is where is the human? Let's put him in a variable. So we have the human. CJ, and we want to know, does CJ have the property foo? <laughs> we'll say uh, does not have property foo. Cool. Uh, and so if I run this, we should get uh, does not have property foo. Um, we'll make it more relevant. We'll say name. And actually, this thing doesn't have the property name because it has a private field name, not just a property name. So it does not have property name. Um, I don't think you could do this. Let's try it. Let's see. Like This would basically be a way of checking to see if it has a private property. Yeah, you can't do that because it's private. It's private, so there's no way to even check in this way. Uh, in this case, you would use that in keyword that we talked about earlier um, if you wanted to check if it had it. But uh, this is really cumbersome. And um, the thing is, you could technically write the code like this. You could say if CJ dot has own property uh, name. You could write the code like this. It's going to work in the same way. However, um, it's safer to do it this way because you don't know if has own property was overridden on that object. Because technically, Technically, I could on this class, I could have a has own. I could I could overwrite it and just return true all the time. So no, no matter what they pass in, yeah, CJ has that property or whoever that human is, uh, and then it does say has property name. Um, and uh, let's take a quick stretch. <laughs> I'd just fire that dev for breaking cardinal rules. That's that's funny. Uh, NFG codex. Um, and uh, the thing is, like, you, you could do this because m most likely has own property has not been overridden. Like, nobody, nobody has a, a good reason for overriding has own property, but you want to be safe. And just in case that property was overridden, you call it from the prototype of the object to make sure that you're getting the real original one and one that hasn't been uh, messed with. Which is why we do it in this way: object.prototype.hasOwn property. I mean, typically, uh, in my code bases, anyways, it's written like this, uh, which is really cumbersome. Enter uh, has own. So ES2022 has introduced this function, uh, which basically makes it so that we don't have to type all this out. So now we can just say uh, object.hasOwn. Let's say CJ. Does CJ have a name? Um, and we can do it like this. So uh, this old cumbersome code of 
object.prototype.hasown property.call now is just object.hasown with CJ. And then I'll just add a note. Uh, don't do this. <laughs> cool. Uh, and now if we run this, does not have property name. Great. Um, so it's not super complex and actually is very polyfillable because you technically could override uh, or add a property to the object prototype that just does this behind the scenes. Um, but it's, it's, pre it's pretty useful, pretty useful. Yeah, and this this article is talking about that, like, or this proposal is talking about that. If the object redefined has own property, you can't ever be sure if you're calling the real one or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not super useful, but I have a lot of code that would get cleaned up by just doing this instead. So, yeah, I think it's useful. All right, uh, we have two more to go. The next one is the class static block. Here we go. I read I read this one earlier to try to figure out what it really does, but uh, we'll try to show, show some examples of it. So uh, ECMAScript class static initialization blocks. So before, if you wanted to do some initialization code for your static properties, you would uh, do it outside of the class itself. So you would typically have like a, a try catch block that is uh, attempting to like override or set um, any of your uh, static variables on that class. But now they're introducing static blocks. So you can actually just say static curly brace. And then inside of those curly braces, you can um, uh, initialize or modify the uh, static variables for that class. And you can reference them by using the this keyword. So inside of the static block, this refers to the class, the actual class itself, not the instance. It refers to the class. So this dot y is actually doing the same thing as like capital C dot y, which is the class name. Um, why is this useful? It just cleans up the code a bit because usually this code would have to be outside of the class. You wouldn't do this kind of code inside of a constructor because a constructor runs every time you create an instance. Um, but if you do it outside, it's only going to run once. And with a static block, this code only runs once. So that's the main benefit there. Um, I would say I don't really benefit from this as much. Like I don't do as much class stuff, and I don't do as many like static properties. But if I did, this would be useful. Yeah. Uh, why didn't they introduce static constructors? I don't know. Um, this is basically a replacement for that, right? Because uh, because this code only runs once, it's kind of like a static constructor that would have only run once. So that's this is how they did it instead of a uh, static constructor. Let's see if they talk about it. Yeah, prior art C sharp static constructors. Basically, this is this is this is a static constructor. <laughs> but if you look at it like in a language like C sharp, um, they would just put the static keyword on the constructor method which is different. In this case, you just use the static keyword, which is a little bit simpler. Cool. And uh, we did, somebody asked the question earlier, can you use, or can you create private fields that are static? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, basically, you just put the static keyword in front of uh, the private uh, uh, field, and it can only be accessed from the given class name um, there. And uh, that noob, thanks for the raid. Welcome in, friends. Uh, shout out to our friend that noob. Yeah, uh, you're working in Go for the first time? But it's episode six. How is it the first time if it's episode six? <laughs> Uh, but welcome in. You know, I, I like being able to stream at other times because all the people that uh, that I never get to see on Fridays, I get to see. So thank you, that noob. Thanks for bringing your friends in. Um, and uh, we got some supports from David. David, thank you for the 15-month prime. But welcome in, Raiders. Uh, we're talking about ES 2022. So, so far, we've talked about all of the new stuff except for error cause. So we're going to talk about that, and then we'll be done. Okay, first time in Go, six time trying it, nice. Um, but welcome in. Okay, next one is error cause. Um, so, why is this useful? 
typically when you're writing code, uh, you might throw an error somewhere and um, it can be hard to tr keep track of where a specific error was thrown, especially if you have like nested try catches and not just directly nested, just like some code over here has a try catch and then it throws an error, but then code that was using that throws an error. It can be hard to keep track of like what actually happened and where it originated. This just adds a cause property to an error. So whenever you create an instance of an error, you can pass in an object with a cause. And that can be the, um, uh, the basically the parent error. Um, so in this case, uh, we're creating a new error that just says download raw resource failed. But the actual error is like a uh, a fetch error in this instance. It's like a, a, a network request error. And by tacking it on there to the cause, uh, that makes it so later on in our code, uh, if we try catch this this here, or if we if we try catch do job, we can get access basically to the parent error. Exactly. So if you're familiar with inner exception in Java or C sharp, that's that's basically what this is. This is the inner exception, um, and it gives us a place to put that. Like technically in JavaScript, you can just add all the properties you want, and you could create like a a custom error class that has a property inner exception, but this is now just like a default way of doing that, which is pretty cool. Um, and so now, yeah, there is a, a cause property on error. So if I say error.cause, uh, it, it can be undefined, but if it's not undefined, that's kind of like the, the inner exception or the parent exception. Um, yeah. And that's it. That's it. I'm not even going to write code to show an example of it because that's basically it. When you create an error, now um, you can pass in that object with the cause. And I would say the, the main scenario where you would use this is inside of a catch. So if you're catching an error. In this case, this is a catch from, uh, from an await, um, which I'm actually not a, I'm not a fan of this code because, because this is mixing await with catch, uh, which I don't like. Um, but regardless, you could have similarly wrapped this in a try catch, but inside of the catch, you would throw a new error and put the cause on there. All right. Um, that is all I have for all of the new features in ES 2022. Uh, like I said, if you want to dig into this stuff further, you can go to the ECMAScript TC39 proposals repo, and um, you can dig in to these finished proposals. These are the ones that are in ES 2022. Um, you can also see what's upcoming. So there's this array find from last that's going to be in ES 2023. And then if you take a look at stage three proposals, these are things that are most likely going to make it into ES 2023. We're about a year away from that, but you can see ahead of time the stuff that might make it in there. Um, also check the description for links to the support tables because that'll tell you what you can actually use uh, in whatever environment that you're in. All right, I'm going to open it up to questions. And then um, we'll end it. So does anyone have any thoughts, comments, questions about all the stuff we talked about? So we, we talked about a lot. We've got private fields and methods. We've got regular expression uh, indices. Uh, we've got top level await. Uh, we've got the app method. We've got has the has own method. Um, what questions do you have? Why would you ever use catch within await? Um, it basically makes it so that your code is a little a little more flat, but I, but I don't like it. I don't like it because like technically this code is still going to run um I guess not. So because they're throwing the error here, this the code below it wouldn't run if it did catch. I believe. I believe. Uh which is a little different cuz if this throws an error, then it's not even going to make it to this part here. Um, but yeah, and that, and fun planet is saying basically that's it. People do this because they don't want to write a try catch. I would much prefer a try catch. You would just wrap this in a try catch and you wrap this in a try catch. And then it's just more consistent because I mean, you, you see that they don't have a dot then, right? They, they have, they're awaiting it, but they're not dot venning it. I guess it's really just style preference. What really gets me is if someone does a dot catch on an await and doesn't throw the error. They're basically just swallowing the error. And then in the code below, this would actually be undefined. 
because the the cat or it would be whatever the catch returns. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions on this stuff? Going once. Going twice. Sold. Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, hopefully you learned something new and hopefully you were exposed to some new stuff. Um, but again, thank you for watching. Uh, tune in on Twitch if you want to see this stuff uh, done live and if you want to ask questions and stuff like that. See you later. Uh, that was the YouTube outro. I'm still going to be here for another 20 or 30 minutes. Hi. Hi, Bob. <laughs> uh, an astrophysicist has a question. How long does it usually take for these new features to reach a good percentage of users? Um, so it, it all is dependent on the, the, the ECMAScript proposal process. So someone has an idea for a new feature. That is a stage zero or a, a straw. I think it's called straw man proposal, meaning it's just an idea. Nobody has actually implemented it yet. Um, when something becomes stage one, um, it has, I believe it has a champion, meaning somebody on the committee. Uh, well, actually it has a, these things have a champion at stage zero too. Yeah. So stage zero has been presented, but not rejected, but they have not achieved any criteria to get into stage one. And then stage one, present problems that the committee is interested in spending time exploring. So basically, if the committee all agrees, hey, we actually like this feature, we want to explore it more, that makes it to stage one. And then I think if any, uh, if anyone has implemented it, so let's say Node.js has implemented this feature, or the Chrome, or uh, the V8 engine, I guess technically Node uses V8, uh, or SpiderMonkey for Firefox, uh, if they've actually implemented it, that's going to get it into... Uh, stage two um, because it's actually out there in the real world and then eventually when multiple people have adopted it it is now stage four and then it's actually put into the um, uh, into the language specification so it's not as simple as now that it is stage four uh, in, uh, JavaScript engines will start implementing it it's basically because JavaScript engines have implemented it, now we can say that it's in the specification. There, yeah, there, no, there is a stage two. It's just not linked here. It's actually on this page. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Hushu? I, yeah, my facial hair is gone. <laughs> yeah, and you can you can get this uh, this shirt over on uh, on merch. Um. Yeah. There it is. Also, we have these new DarkJS ones, if you're interested in that. Um, and this is a good time to plug my, uh, my email list. So I have started an email list. Um, I, ha I, could, I do live notifications there. And then there's also a news and updates uh, list. So uh, if you're a part of the community and you want to stay in touch, please join the mailing list. Uh, the idea there is... Um, if I ever get kicked off of any of these platforms, or they, of, of these plaf platforms cease to exist, like uh, Twitch or YouTube or Twitter or whatever, or even Discord, if I have your email, I can stay in contact with you. Uh, and if you sign up for the mailing list, you'll get a code for 10% off uh, the merch. But also, you don't have to use that code because that, that digs into my profit. So if you want to support me and give me $5, you can buy a shirt without the code but if you only want to give me $2.50, you can sign up for the mailing list and then use the code to buy a t-shirt. Yeah. But uh, no worries, that noob. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit that down. So any of the extra stuff that happened, I'll, I'll edit out. So, yeah, you, you didn't crash anything. Um, I found myself in a situation to recommend a front-end framework for use at my company. What would you recommend for new projects in 2022? I would say take a look at Vue. It's a beautiful thing. Um, Vue 3 is the latest and greatest, but it's been out for a little over a year and there are still community projects that haven't fully migrated to Vue 3 yet, which is unfortunate, but it's getting there. And, um, I would recommend it. Um, you could also look into Svelte. The issue with Svelte is that the, 
uh, ecosystem and community is a little bit smaller because it hasn't been around for as long. And if you're building with Svelte, you probably would use Svelte Kit. But it, it just, it, uh, it doesn't, it hasn't been around long enough for me to recommend it as the thing that you start with. Um, and then there's also React. If you want to do what everyone else is doing, just do React. Also, if you're going to be hiring devs, you probably want to do React because most dev devs out there know React. But if you want to enjoy your life as a coder, use Vue. That's that's my answer to that. Yeah. What about a code? Like like a toad? Toad code? <laughs> yeah. I've, how do I do that? Do I just pull up uh, FFZ settings? Non mod settings. Control panel. Where's it at? Data management, profiles. Oh. Oh. Um, but yeah, to, to uh, disperse this question, um, what do I think about Angular? So, I mean, Angular is fine. It's just, it's just very different from a lot of the other stuff. I will say it's very... Uh, in enterprise -y, like enterprise code. Like if you're familiar with large enterprise Java code bases, Angular is very similar. So if that's what you like, uh, yeah. Uh, the devs have a background in Angular. I'm just recommending sticking with it even though my life... Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's what I would recommend as well. Like if, if your devs already know it, it's less time ramping up. And honestly, honestly, with Angular, you kind of end up with... It's easier to end up with more organized code than it is with really any of the other ones that I mentioned because it has so many opinions. Um, like if you do React, there's a lot of uh, uh, questions you have to answer up front about uh, what do you want to use for routing? What do you want to use for testing? What do you want to use for uh, state management? There's all these questions you have to answer, which takes up time and is not actual development, whereas Angular has already answered all of those questions for you. I would say Vue has answered a lot of questions as well. Vue is a good middle ground between Angular and React because like, it has some opinions, but not a lot. I don't know. Okay, here we go. Um... Import from URL. That's amazing, Alka. <laughs> Look at this. So now I have a, a focus start, 30 minutes, focus in, like, focus end. Oh, it just, it just runs it. Huh. And then, um... I can add all of my uh, frequently used commands in here, I'm guessing. Wow. Actions room. And then I can add a new action. Um, oh, profile in the top left. I see. Click here. This profile is not active. This profile will update automatically. Are you going to hack me, Alka, <laughs> if, I, if I enable this? Um, how do I make it active?
Be- oh, the pop out is Franker. The Franker phase is Twitch chat. I see. I see. Cool. That's great. Yeah, I can add other commands too as well. Uh, you did Veritatis, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna clip that. Uh, so you'll be able to watch it in in the vods. Nice, glad to hear it. Namaste, geek. Thanks, thanks for repping the coding garden. Um, yeah. You subbed, but you lost the code. Well, just just give me more money. Let's just instead of using the code. Um, if if you if you DM me on Discord, I'll send you, I'll send you the code. What do I think about Angular? Yeah, I mentioned my thoughts on Angular. It, it's fine. I don't like it because it has too many opinions, opinions that I don't agree with, but opinions are good to prevent devs from arguing over things that aren't actually productive. So, yeah. Yeah, and you should have gotten the email, the, the link to the, the, the list. Do, 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 do. Yeah, everyone keeps talking about Dino and Fresh. It would be cool to take a look at. Maybe I'll take a look at this next week. We can dedicate an entire stream to it. Um, it's a next-gen web framework. Um, Fireship did a video on it. Um, welcome in, uh, Eddie Crimea. I'll, I'll direct you to the Frequently Asked Questions and anyone that's new here. Check out the, the Frequently Asked Questions. Um, a lot of stuff in here. Uh, I think I have something on stats. Yeah. How do you show all those stats? I use iStat menus version five. Um, there's a link to it. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, I shaved. <laughs> I look so different, but what's up, uh, Denzilf? Welcome in. Welcome in. How do I change my status message? Uh, exclamation mark set dash status. Is it set status or set dash status? It is, there's no dash. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. Oh yeah, I was gonna show you uh, Fireship's new video on, well not new, I think, yeah, it was six days ago. Um, check him out, he's great. That took me an hour and a half. I, I've, I, I feel like I can edit that down to like 20 or 30 minutes. That took me a long time. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see what else we got going on. Um, JIT rendering on the edge. JIT usually stands for just in time. Um, so it renders just in time instead of ahead of time. That would be the difference. Post the link. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, honestly, just just go to YouTube and search for Fireship. It's his latest video. You'll, you'll be able to find it. Uh, I'm only going to be streaming for another 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so uh, someone uh, asked, asked about uh, doing a tutorial on Insomnia, which is a tool for making web requests. I think I'll save that for another day, but that will actually be... Um, a good, good, good content. Um, I think I'll save the mini game for another day. I think what I'm going to do right now is fix the drop game because that seems to be the most pressing thing. So I'm going to fix the drop game and then I'm going to head out. Um, but yeah, yeah. Somebody mentioned that earlier. There's a bunch of commands not on there, and I think it's because they're from my bot, which isn't um, the Streamlabs bot.
on the edge uh, typically means servers that are serving up the requests. So in, in a complex uh, server architecture, um, you might have uh, load balancing and caching. So you actually have multiple servers running, but there is an edge server, which is the server that ultimately serves up the request that is balancing the load between other servers um, or is uh, grabbing content from other servers and then caching it on the edge. Or Basically, the, the server that users are accessing is the edge. And, um, and all, it doesn't have to be a complex architecture like that. Like technically, if you have a single server and that's serving up all of your requests, that is an edge server. But it's typically used to talk about uh, more complex architectures. Have I experienced burnout and I've, have I gotten out of it? I have experienced burnout. I don't think I'm out of it, but I'm better than I was. <laughs> I basically took uh, an entire month vacation. Um, but I've always said this, that like, uh, if you're feeling burnt out, it's already too late. Like you should build breaks and, uh, vacations into your life and into your schedule so that you don't burn out. Because if, like I said, if you're feeling burnt out, it's already too late. Um, and the only way to fix it is to take breaks. So, yeah. Yeah. Will I learn new languages? Absolutely, yeah. Il Clarkio, what's up, dude? Thank you for the, the tier one. Yeah, so take breaks, rest, uh, and shout out to our friend Clarkio. Boom, check him out. Yeah, yeah, and it, the thing is, it's it's hard advice to give because for a lot of people, they already are, are burnt out, and it's not helpful but you really just, you just got to take a break. You got to take breaks and breaks of all kinds, like not just vacation, but like make sure you're stepping away from your desk every hour or so. Um, make sure you try to have a good like work-life balance where like work ends at five and then you don't even think about it. Um, make sure that you do take vacation days, all, all of those things. Yeah, but it's tricky. All right, let's work on the drop game. So um, I'm going to do this in a way that some of you aren't going to like. Um, but a while back, like I, at least a year at this point, we started on a complete rewrite, rewrite of the drop game. Seething Drop V2, Revenge of the Newts. Um, but that one has not reached feature parity yet. It still has a lot of work to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update uh, the old one to use my latest chat API, and then eventually we'll finish writing Seedling Drop V2. Um, yeah, Seedling Drop V2 uses uh, P5.js, but the old one just uses DOM code. And... Uh, Jen Kirovic, uh says, uh, if you tend to work longer, try to make plans with your friends, which would force you to go out. That's a good, a good way to kind of like force yourself to take breaks. But also, your image is broken. <laughs> we fixed this last time. I think this might be the only broken image I've seen so far today. Everyone, if you're listening to this and you're near the keyboard, just say hi. Say hi in chat. I want to see how many people's images are broken. Because if it's more than one, I might try to fix that too. Hi, hi, hello. Hello. Hey everybody, nice to see you all. I didn't mention, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but it's cool to be streaming. Um, oh, it's open, it's broken on Twitch. You, you trickster. You. <laughs> um. Somebody said they were going to do that. Look at that. Is it because your account was created so long ago? Huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's not my it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. <sighs> 
Yeah, I'm I'm guessing they created their account before profile images were required. Yeah, and so right now, um, if you have if you're if you're not following the channel or you haven't been following the channel for at least thirty minutes, I don't show your image at all. Um, just because some people might try to create nasty images and then get them to show up in my chat overlay. So it takes a little bit before they show up. I haven't, Alka. Um, but I should. I got I got your message on Discord. I didn't respond to it, but um I need to try it. The thing is I'm using it in my back end. And that controls everything. I don't know a good way to test it. I, I um, honestly, I could just switch to it and see if anything breaks. I think I'll do that next stream. Let's fix the drop game. Okay. Um, the last time we touched this code was in 2020, so two years ago. Uh, I'm going to hide my screen just for a second to make sure the, the tokens and stuff aren't revealed. Um, oh, there, there's no there's no special config anyways. Um, cool. And then it is using socket IO. Cool. All right, we can make it happen. So uh, yes, for those of you asking about the drop game, first of all, credit where credit is due, our good friend, friend Instafluff invented the drop game. Uh, and he has a uh, game studio called Pixel Plush Studio um, where he makes games. And then um, he has this uh, parachute drop game that anyone can add to their stream. Uh, that's I didn't. That must be a new emote. That's awesome. Um, that uh, basically in the chat you say drop. It has a uh, you, a thing that falls from the sky, and it tries to land on the target, which is in a random location. Um, I created my own version of that which uh, has a, a garden, and I'll show it really quick. It's, uh, it's this, so this is the garden, and if your drop lands in it, it grows a seedling. But right now, it's broken, because if you, if you try to run drop, nothing will happen, and the issue is it's pointing to my old backend server, and I just need to point it to my new backend server. So here's the code. Uh, my message server is actually going to be um, api.coding.garden that should be it and then we can see everywhere that uses the uh, message server in here cool and it's here basically um, But I need to create a, a feathers client because my API has a feathers backend. Um, so it's going to be something like this. And actually, there is no live chat ID. Where is the live chat ID even used? It's used in messages there. Okay, so uh, now instead of this socket thing, um, we're going to create an instance of um, not the high score client. We're going to call this the messages client. And then it gets configured with config dot uh, message server. And then the messages service is going to be the uh, messages client to get the messages service, something like that. And then we don't need to do any of that. Um, 
And then, yeah, now instead of socket.on messages, we actually can just do uh, messages service dot on create something like this. Uh, the problem is the code in the code is that it's pointed at an old backend that really isn't working anymore. So I'm just pointing it to my new backend, and I basically just have to update the code to look at my new backend. Um, something like this. I need I need to look I need to look at my code other code though, um, because uh, Vox. Um, which is my question and answer website, this thing. Uh, it's pointed at the new backend, and it actually, I think, has a commands listener, and that's what I need. I need to listen for commands, but then I only listen for the drop command. Um, so I'm going to look at my Vox code really quick just to see how I do that. Okay, here we go. This has a better configure method. Um, I'm going to use that instead. And then I believe the messages service is Twitch. Um, I think I can do slash commands. So it's only listening for commands. Um, something like this. Um, and then somewhere I list, yeah, so command service on created. So when a new command is sent in the chat um, is when we want to do a thing. And um, that's going to give us the specific message or the command that was run. Yeah, this this Vox stuff is view 2, old view 2 code. Okay, that should be all I need. And then I need to make sure that I have the surface name right. So this is this is using pointing to a feathers backend. Um, but if I look on GitHub, I can see all of my service names uh, here. So if we look in services, um, Twitch slash commands is the service that I care about. Um, here. Great. And then we'll call this command. Um, and for now, other things are going to break. Uh, I'm actually just going to replace this like this. What's up, Lex Yang? Welcome in. Um, I don't need a for each. I just need that. And then um, I'm just going to rename this variable to command, command.message. But um, I need to see um, what the properties are on that given command. OK, so uh, I'm going to debug this. It's port 3002. Here we go. So. Um, app.js line 37. Yeah, there are no high scores. That's fine. So in the chat, if you just do exclamation mark drop, yeah, yeah, people are doing it, but I'm not getting it. Yeah, 
uh, I gotta fix that American 2050, but let's just see, like, is there a um, WebSocket connection to api.coding.garden? There is. It's this one. Um... Yeah, and then I guess this has messages. I'm guessing the command service is broken then if that's not the if that's not working. We can listen to the 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 entire messages service. So, uh Twitch slash chat would give us actual chat messages. Commands, um, um, I thought was like separating out the commands from the chat, but I think chat includes everything. Let's try listening on the, um, chat. All right. Um, now we do that. Nothing. <laughs> Am I in the right folder? Um, Think so? Oh, good call, American 2050. Apparently, there is a build process. Or is there? No? No? Uh, I'm going to end the stream when, it, when I'm done fixing this. Hmm. Oh, I see. For the chat service and the command service, um, I have to have a valid API key. But for the Vox Populi service, it's public for any of the like the listed items huh so I think I need to change that for the back end or for really I need to change that for the commands hmm acid spark what's up friend thank you for the 27 months much appreciated well Do I want to? I don't know if I want to send. I guess I will send my API key. I guess I will. Um, that's what I'm going to do. And then I can put it in the config. So over here in the config, I can say uh, something like uh, message server config key. I'll throw in my API key there. And then whenever I connect to the server, um, I do it like this. Let's call it message server uh, API key. Cool. All right. Let me grab that API key. And then uh, I think at that point we can just listen to uh, commands.
Mm. Any reason I have a backend? It does all the processing of the messages. Like, I technically could just, just use TMIJS. Um, but... It's this. It's the same thing powering like this. This overlay and then the chat overlay on my desktop. So I was thinking I might as well use uh, that backend already because it it does. Uh, also, it do, it does emote parsing um, for uh, like Frinker faces and better Twitch TV and stuff like that. So it handles it handles a lot of extra stuff and it like sanitizes messages. It does a lot of stuff on the backend. Um, It does everything. Okay, I got that wrong. It's uh, key is the URL parameter, not API key. And then um, like that. And then, <laughs> what's the difference between right now and just now? Um, I think right now is like one or two seconds, and then just now is more than that. It's just from the library that we're using. That's really funny. I've never noticed. Just now? Right now. Apparently, just now is less than 10 seconds ago, and then right now is like less than two seconds ago. OK. Um, So that's fine. <laughs> do 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 Okay, it's sort of working. Um, it's just not logging.
Why isn't it logging? What's up? <laughs> RWX Rob, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome in, raiders. Uh, you, you've caught me in the middle of coding. Um, that's why you can't see my screen right now because I'm dealing with some like API keys and stuff. In just a second, a second, I'll show you what I'm working on. Um, but uh, basically, I'm working on an overlay game that's been broken for a while, and we're trying to fix it. But yeah, welcome in, friend. A uh, shout out to RWX Rob. Uh, who was working on Kubernetes microservices. Nice. <laughs> we are patient. That's good. <laughs> um, I guess my commands service is just straight up broken. Might have to listen to chat anyways. Hmm. Yep. We're just going to have to go with chat, and that's fine. That goes there, that goes there. No, it's not working at all. What? <laughs> I might need to rewrite the back end. I know I need to I need to just update some of the services on the back end cuz I just haven't used them in a while. What's up, Chad? <laughs> All right, finally. Whew. Okay, we've done it. Um, and I specifically want to look at the um, message property. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, I need to fix some other things. So command dot user dot profile image URL. All right, this is the winner, I think. Um, try it. So in the chat, just try it, drop, exclamation mark, drop. Uh, what? It's not working. So I'm listening to Twitch chat, um, listening on created. 
Okay, so here's a message. Oh! Okay, so I know what's happening. I only get messages. I don't get commands. Because the commands are delegated to the command service, and then the command service wasn't even working. <laughs> well... So like these these are just plain chat messages, but if you send a command, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing it in my uh, over here. So I do need to update the back end. Okay. Let's let's just look at our Twitch command service and see why it might not be working. Um Spam! What's up, uh, Dad? What that? Uh, welcome in. Thank you for the spam. We appreciate you. Um, there's a lot going on in here. I guess I need I need to look at my Sprout Kit code to see how it handles um, the commands. And I think, like, if we look at chat, and it calls, uh, lib services, chat users rewards. How do I even get access to commands? Hmm. Um, the drop game did actually work after the Twitch API changes. I think it's more so to do with my services, things that went wrong with stuff that I, I had written. Um, debugging your old code is like debugging some, yeah, it, it absolutely, I mean, I haven't touched a lot of this code in like a year or two years and it's really messy, but it has worked for the most part. So the... Messages does have a type, which can be command. And messages is an array of messages, and it's likely that Twitch chat is popular. The Twitch chat service is populating those messages. Twitch chat on created. That's what I think the problem is, Jamuth. The chat service is not broadcasting commands. But, um...
The thing is, when I run commands, like, like this overlay is able to detect the command, uh, like, focus start, like this command. Which means, <laughs> this, this overlay, um, yeah, th this is my desktop app over here, but this overlay is listening for commands. I can't, I just can't find the code where it is listening for commands. Uh, let's see, though. My eyes got wide because the only place that is found is in bundled built code, not actual code, which means it got removed at some point. Well, <laughs> that that doesn't make sense though because um it it works and I don't like every time like if I change code this this thing will refresh. Um Mm. Mm. Uh, we're not playing Clash of Code today. Everything is falling apart. Um. That that just can't be the case, right? Um, electron serve. And what's up, Hughes? Um, I'm thinking the first course I'm going to make is, uh, intro to full stack development, but it's not going to be like a full boot camp. It's going to be like maybe two hours long but it introduces the full stack and all the ideas in the full stack to people that may be interested in it or complete beginners. That's going to be the first one. And then the second course I create is going to be uh, intermediate JavaScript. And Nikki Poo, thank you for the bits. Thank you for the bits. That must be it. Here's So here's the thing. I, I can... I can if I change this code, this overlay is going to refresh. Watch, watch me. Um, let's change some styles. Um, oh no, that's chat web. We want chat. I guess I can do it on the action. So this is the action bar, this thing up here. Um, it has this background, but if I say background red and save it, it's red. Look at that. <laughs> it's, it's red, So which means I can change the code here and then uh, it rebuilds and refreshes, right? But this focus start code is only in the built code. It's not in the, um... is it that, <sighs> I see, I changed how it works, I changed how it works. I'm not listening for commands anymore. Well, yeah, it, it is open source. Uh, some of this code hasn't been pushed up yet, which I do need to do, but it's, uh, it's over here 
on SproutKit. So this is the front end piece. There are like multiple overlays and this Electron app. And then um, this is the back end piece. So this is a, a Feathers API that listens to Twitch chat and then fires it out as socket events. Piggyback off another bot. Y yeah, so I'm looking at the responses rather than the actual message content. Um, I I'm convinced I just actually just... I just need to fix the back end. Like the back end is not emitting commands and it needs to. That's what that's what I need to fix. So let's look into that. Um, yep. Uh, Jim Muth, you're you're right about that, but so feathers uh, there's two different ways to use it. You can make direct requests for things like find, and that will return things from the database that match a query. And so that's why I'm doing commands false, because I'm getting all of those back. But then on top of that, I have a socket event. So I'm listening for when messages are created. And apparently only messages that are not commands are emitted as an event. Um, I honestly think I might know where this is happening. There's a channels. I found it. I'm going to fix the code instantly. Watch me. Okay. So in Feathers.js, there's this concept of channels. Uh, ch it's a very... Uh, <laughs> what's up, Stony Eagle? It's a very similar concept to channels in Socket.io in that messages will only appear on a given channel. Now, what is happening is... Um, I am not handling when the path is Twitch slash commands, so no socket events are getting emitted. So I just need to add an or statement here. So if the path is Twitch commands, which is another service, then put them into the API key channel so that it actually emits the events. That's what's missing. So that's why I wasn't seeing any events from Twitch commands. And then... I can just double check that I'm calling it the right thing. Yeah, so Twitch commands is the service. All right, that's the fix. Now I just have to deploy the back end, and on my front end, I should be able to listen to commands. Um, we'll call this the command service. And then when a command is created, Uh, we should be able to see it. Okay. Um, let me redeploy my backend. And, uh, well, I got to push this change up. Deploy to production without testing? Absolutely, we do that all the time here. Um, okay, we've restarted the API. And now, nice. Can't access property display name. Command.author is undefined. I love to see it. It's working. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, oh, it's happening. Okay. Um, but let me just make sure I'm getting the, the right stuff. So command.user.display underscore name. That's what we want. Okay, try now. It's working. And then if if you land in the garden, not quite in the garden, if you land in the garden, then your name will pop up like this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. And then there he is, Mark Boots. Nice. We did it. Uh, 
Yeah, the 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 first one always no emotes aren't broken. If you do exclamation mark drop with nothing on the other side of it, you're gonna get the seedling, which is this. Um, but yeah, someone tried dropping an emote. Drop. Um, coding clap. So those are those are broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to fix that. Um, yeah, emotes are broken. But let's figure out why. Um, All right, this should fix it. All right, so let's try dropping emotes now. Yeah, and then uh, the uh, the animated emotes work too, which is great. Um, that's a so that's another benefit of um, switching to my backend because it's parsing out and replacing the 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 animated ones. Um, I do believe there's a timeout. Let's see how long the timeout is. Um, Can't even, can't even see it. Oh. Ninety seconds. Ninety seconds is the timeout. Um, but actually, I had removed the timeout. Okay, now there's a 90 second timeout. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna actually end the stream really, really soon. Um, but we have the drop game. And then over on this scene, drop game should work as well. Emojis are broken? I can't drop a balloon? I guess not. Let's fix it. Um, can't access property split. Command parsed messages. Oh, I got it. I got it. It's not broken. I think I think it is though. Um, I saw an error in the console that I need to fix. Um, Yes. All right. Now we we should be able to drop. No, it's not. I don't think it's working. Oh no, it is. It is. They just took a while. Cause there's there's a balloon. <laughs> yeah, it is working. Great, we've done it. All right. Uh, anybody that, that came in from the raid with RWX Rob, thanks, if you're still here, thanks for sticking around. Um, normally, my coding is much more interactive and like I explain what I'm doing, but uh, this code is so old 
and um, I haven't seen it in so long that it's very hard for me to kind of explain while I'm going. But uh, this is basically what we were working on. So uh, it's a little game on my overlay where you can do exclamation mark drop, and if it lands in the garden, you get your name on the screen. That's it. Yeah. There are probably more edge cases. Yeah. There probably are. <laughs> And again, uh, shout out to our friend uh, Instafluff. Uh, he created the drop game. I just re rebuilt it and made my own version with the nice coding garden theme. So, yeah, we've done it. Drop game is fixed. Uh, let me make sure that all my other um, scenes, like this one, have the drop game on it. Um... Mm-hmm. 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 Great. Great. <laughs> uh, will the next version have collision? This one does have collision. I think it's just turned off. So we can actually turn it on. But the issue is... Um, with collision turned on, if there are too many drops, it gets really, really slow. Um... So I think we just commented out process collision here. Here. So we'll, let's just turn collisions on for a little bit. Um, everyone drop right now. Just type exclamation mark drop with your favorite emote or emoji. Um, and you'll see that if they collide with each other, actually, it... Yeah, there we go. We, you see it happening. They, they bounce off of each other. But the issue is when there's a thousand drops at the same time, the, the, the overlay just comes to a crawl, which is why we started rewriting it with P5.js, which is more of like a, it can do lots of updates and thousands of collisions without uh, slowing everything down. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the drop game is back. Awesome. Okay, uh, I think that's all I was going to do for today. Um, we got stuff for next time. The next stream is tomorrow evening, and I think we're actually going to do, we're going to bring Code Katas back. So if you remember years ago, uh, we used to, every every Wednesday, we did it every Wednesday for, for years, um, we would solve Code Wars Code Katas. We're bringing it back. We're bringing it back. Uh, I think at this point we're on like episode, yeah, 60-ish. Um, but tomorrow evening we're going to do some code katas. Um, it would be fun to like create a mini game tomorrow or something like that. But that's the plan. Uh, if you haven't joined the Discord, I send out live notifications and updates and stuff like that. Um... And then, uh, yeah, uh, if you want to <laughs> keep track of the schedule, you can go here. Um, I'm right now I'm keeping my schedule updated on, uh, on the Twitch schedule page. But if you look at discord, um, in the announcements channel, there's actually a link here. I'll pull it up. There is a link to, um, a Google calendar that you can follow uh, if you want updates on my, if you want my sk schedule to be merged with, with your calendar. Um, so on the discord, go to the announcements channel, and then there's a link here to a Google calendar. I'm going to keep this updated, including fixing that typo, but, uh, that's the next stream tomorrow at 8 PM my time. But when you view this page, you should be able to see it in your time. I'll just link this in the chat. Honestly, we need to, um, uh, we need to put that in the chat command. I'll do that later. Um, what if we merged our calendars? Um, you mean like this published calendar and your calendar? You can. You can merge them. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for tuning in. This is great. I'm so happy that I got to go live on a Tuesday. It's It's been a really long time since I did that. Um, thanks everyone for hanging out. Thank you for all your input. Thank you for all the supports. Let's see, did I miss any? Um... Yeah, I think I got them all, but yeah, thank you. David Snyder with 100 bits. Uh, Nookie Poo with the 250 bits. Thank you for that. Uh, the drop game is on GitHub, but I need I need to push it up. Um, 
I actually don't think I added anything proprietary because what I did was this. So in my config, I'm not actually embedding the API key. I'm just saying look for it in local storage or look for it in a param. So I'll push this up. Um, Cool. Uh, I'm going to add spatial subdivision for collisions. Oh, is that faster? <laughs> I would say, like, honestly, honestly, the fact that we're completely rewriting it, um, I, I do want to do that collision detection myself, but, but not here. So th this is the, the code base that we were working in. There's also seedling drop v2. And this is a complete rewrite using p5.js. And like object-oriented, look at all these objects and such. We're, we're doing a, we're trying our best to write good code for the rewrite. I would accept a pull request on this repo. This repo, not as much because I do want to make the updates on stream. Okay, that's it, that's all. Uh, thank you, we had some more supports. Uh, Carvax, thank you for that prime sub. All right, we're going on a raid. I don't know where we're gonna raid. But uh, wherever we do, uh, show them lots of love. Drop a follow if you like what they're doing. Uh, if you're a sub, you can use that raid message. If you're not a sub, you can use this raid message. Um, you can also come up with your own raid message. And we also have uh, a new Coding Garden raid emote, so you can try using that as well. Actually, I mean, that would be really cool for me to implement in the P5 version. But if you want to implement it on that one, go right ahead. I would happily merge that. Okay, uh, join the Discord. Um, uh, join the email list. That's my that's my last my last shout out, um, so that I can stay in touch with you. Please join the email list. Uh, you will get if you after joining, you'll get a ten percent off uh, coupon code for merch if you want to get this T-shirt or any of the other T-shirts. All right, you're wonderful. I appreciate you all. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you tomorrow evening. Wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this.